Good morning and uh, welcome to the December 6th meeting of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. Could we start with a roll call? Oh. Anything? Oh. We're off to such a promising start. Stubborn. So she still knows what she's doing. Oh, she's she has a memory like an elephant. <laughs> she remembers <laughs> things. I don't miss Chris at real estate before. Scary. It's they scary. Have to, they have to uh, they have to catch planes. Obviously, the fix is in. Do you want to wait? We're getting the IT folks, but it seems not to be coming on. So. Well, uh, can anybody hear us is the question. Can you hear us? Yeah. Glad you don't live in my district. Uh, what's the preference of the group? Should we start? Yes. If people can't hear us, that's what I'm. Commissioner Olenek? Here. Commissioner Bertrand? Commissioner Here. Brown? Here. Commissioner Johnson? Here. Commissioner Kaufman Gomez? Commissioner Caput? Here. Commissioner Alternate Schifrin? Here. Commissioner Alternate Mulhern? Here. Commissioner Leopold? Here. Commissioner McPherson? Here. Commissioner Bator? Here. Commissioner Chase? Here. And Commissioner Rotkin? Well, uh, we're going to take things a little out of order this morning. Um, uh, after a conversation at last uh, month's meeting about getting an update from Progressive Rail, we were able to secure uh, the, uh, uh, the owner and president of Progressive Rail to come here and make a presentation. They have to catch a plane. Uh, back to the Midwest, and so uh, we're going to have their presentation first, and then we'll move on with the rest of the agenda. So we'll move to uh, our first item, which is a progressive rail update, and there's a report. Um, and I don't know whether, uh, Mr. Dondere, you're going to make any introduction or no. Um, Do we have a mic? Not yet. Uh, I have no introduction, but I'm just wondering if we need the sound system. Yeah. Or... How soon are we... Uh, Fernanda's over at the IT department. Okay. Oh, Fernanda's back from the IT department. <laughs> um, well, we're going to hold on then for a moment uh, so everybody can hear.
the Royal. What, which number? 
paper here? No. It's coming. So w what's nice about the, the whole Santa Cruz Railroad in the Watsonville area that we're doing is that, there we go, our first locomotive has arrived, another one's coming right behind it. It's a GP15, 1500 horse. You're looking at a typical train doing its work throughout the day. It's clean, it's modern. We named it the city of Watsonville. Another one's coming, it's made to this in time. And what you're seeing today there is how the freight is delivered safely, efficiently. You're seeing the train with very low impact, no emissions that you can see visually. It's a very clean, carbon-free way to go, or lower carbon-free way to go. The next one is, is exciting when you see all the infrastructure investments that we're doing. So not only are we FRA compliant, but we're going above and beyond. Uh, more ties, more ballast, more infrastructure, new turnouts. You can see the crews working down below here in the bottom inset photos, repairing a turnout in an industry that hadn't had cars in 20 years. It's a big difference what we're doing. It's putting the money into the facility, and this is our money. We're not using state money, we're not using county money, we're not using industry money. We're doing it on our own because we believe in this industry and we believe in the railroad. I think that's important. You know, we're not asking for any, any subsidies whatsoever. Well, you got the local crew here coming up next, which is nice. And you'll see that it's local people, local community members. We, you know, again, we're hiring local, we're keeping it local, and we're proud of that as well. New employer base in the community as well. Uh, moving on, this is one of my favorite photos right here, is that train alone is taking 12 trucks off the highway. And that's nice, when you look at it, it just slips in and out, very unintrusive, does its work, and it's gone. There isn't any of the congestion or any of the issues that come with all the trucks in the community. And when you look at what's happening in the world, rail transportation is a great option because freight is expected to double by 2036. So when you think of the congestion today, look at 2036, because our own government accounting office says all you think about on freight today, plan on it doubling by 2036. So rail is very important for relieving congestion giving you more options for the industries and having a cleaner option as well. Next one coming up. We've got, it's, it's, it's interesting what we're doing is explaining our value proposition is when you look at the less carbon, that's such a big part of our story, is that how can we do the freight, how can we do it better, how can we do it without the carbon? And it's four times less, you know, a ton of freight can move four to 500 miles on just one gallon of diesel. It's huge depending on the car and what you're doing. So when you look at that combined with the efficiencies in the market and what we're doing on the railroads, it's really a nice value proposition. You've seen this in the local paper, the next one coming up, is that when we came here, one of the big concerns was all the tank cars. And we made a promise that we're gonna get them out of here. It's been a hard process contractually. It's been a hard process to get them to move because the incumbent customer did not want to leave. And we made a big issue and we put a lot of effort into it to cancel the contract and get them out. And that's something that we said we're gonna do it and we're well over half doing it. They have to go out five at a time. There's a restriction with the Union Pacific, but every day, which is more expensive for us versus bringing a big string out, which would have been a lot easier. But every day, when the UP allows us, we take five out a day. So we're averaging about 20 cars a week. And they'll be gone, we're down just, just a handful now. So I think that's important to notice that when we make a commitment, we're gonna do it. What we say we're gonna do, we're gonna do. And we wanna be collaborative along the way. I think that's important too. And in conclusion for the presentation, we can obviously go beyond with some questions, but you know, you've got the local team here. You've got people that, that, that care about the community. You've got people that, you know, frequent visits to industries, frequent collaboration. How do we make every industry here, big and small, more competitive? How do we create a better value? And how do we make the railroad perform well? And th that, is so much the core of what I do. We've got a team of 200 people here that are part of Progressive Rail, we're proud of them all. And if you have any questions, I'm more than willing to take them. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate it. Now I'll see whether my colleagues have questions. Uh, Mr. Bertrand. Welcome here, and um, thank you for keeping up your promise on removing the rails. Oh, excuse me, the uh, vacant trails. No uh, rails. Trains. <laughs> yeah, there you go. No rails. <laughs> Too many <laughs> concepts on my mind here. So. Um, what I'm concerned about is um, a couple of things to do with your potential business um, in your performer. When you approached us, you talked about how much you felt there was potential in Watsonville and up quarter. So I was wondering if you'd comment on uh, your progress to date on what business you're developing in Watsonville and what you feel is potential up quarter towards uh, Davenport. 
Watsonville has been a gem. So we've called on all the, the industries that are obvious and we're calling on the next, second, and third tier industries that have never shipped by rail. And the response we're getting is, is phenomenal. And what we hear time after time again is trucks are short in supply, they're expensive, and they're unreliable. So we're encouraged and we're working in the rate stages. It takes time to onboard a new industry to rail. So it's the rates, the cars, everything you have to do to build the supply chain. We probably have 20 to 25 different, just now active leads that we're working on various levels, different commodities. I'll introduce to you Phil Smales here. Phil's a colleague of mine and he's in our sales and marketing department. Maybe you can extend on that a little bit. Yeah, Dave, we, uh, as Dave said, we have several customers, potential customers. Yeah, you want to go to the microphone. Sorry, usually I'm too loud on this. Uh, we have several customers that are interested in looking at rail, and, and my my uh, task and, and as director of marketing for the St. Paul and Pacific Railway is to bring those customers on to, to grow the, the business on the rail. And most of this, almost all of it, is business that is currently moving on truck. And so, as Dave said, we have several several opportunities and to quantify it, I would say you're looking at thousands of truckloads that will be taken off the roads. A lot of that has to do with the economics of trying to get trucks these days, which are very difficult and very expensive. So the potential customers we're talking to see that as a real economic benefit. But then if you overlay that with the, with the, you know, the actual physical taking of that many truckloads, which surprised us in terms of we did the math and we saw how many truckloads they were actually shipping. Uh, you'll see a, a, a physical, true physical difference in terms of the, the congestion that you'll be on the highway, just in terms of the number of trucks we're seeing in just since August 15th. We haven't been working on this that long, but it's, it's obvious. So there's a lot of opportunity. So if you could take any trucks off of the Highway 17, I think everyone in Santa Cruz would appreciate that. Um, so in going with Progressive, St. Paul, excuse me, Watsonville? Was it St. Paul? St. Paul and Pacific? Yep, St. Paul and Pacific, uh, get the right term. Um, it's still a play off with the concerns of this community. So when you say you'll be able to deliver on moving product for customers, your customers, our uh, employers here, uh, whether whatever industry it is, that has to play off against what the negatives are for the community. So I would uh, like a report from you in six months to a year, telling us what you are actually done in actual numbers, because I want to know exactly how many trucks I want to be able to say to the community that when we go with Progressive St. Paul uh, Pacific, that we're actually giving a benefit that outweighs the losses to this community in terms of trains on the quarter and things like that. That has to be demonstrated to the community so they actually know the benefits. And I'll give you time to do that because you're just starting. Thank you. Be more than happy to do that. We can do it quarterly, biannual, and we'll be collaborative about it. And have one more question. All right. Okay. So I got put into the contract of provision that you would uh, do meetings with the public to address our concerns. And that was in base, uh, I think uh, one of your officers suggested we'd be willing to do that. So that's now in the agreement with Progressive, and we would like to see that follow through at no, we don't want to be pushing for it. We would like to see you do it on your own so that when you have things to tell us, we could come up with a meeting and allow the public to come and address concerns and hear what you have to say. I don't want it to be a push. I'd like to be a pull on your part. Thank you. Understood. And we actually have some more outreach safety programs coming with Operation Lifesaver and some other things where we can tie in that with a meeting afterwards so everyone will be there. And more to come. We're working on that, actually. Yeah, you're you're now operating in a community, Saint, um, Santa Cruz, that demands the right to have public input. That's a very critical thing in this community. The public here are very involved, and we expect to be received that way. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Ms. Kaufman Gomez. Thank you. Good morning, Chair. Yes, hi. Um, I'm Trina from Watsonville. So um, if our entire community can hear the horns. So we recognize uh, what kind of activity is going on with uh, Progressive downtown. Uh, the vendors have, uh, many of them have approached me and, and are really pleased with the activity that they're getting with um, your, your contract to help move their products and services. Uh, we had a factory sale, one of which was right along the, the line, and I'm hoping that you'll be able to pick up some of those vendors too to, to realize that this is uh, another 
way of getting their product um, out of our community that's being uh, manufactured in our community here. Um, and in terms of a public venue, we have a very nice uh, chambers. Maybe we can see about getting you placed on the city's agenda for being able to present into the community um, of Watsonville itself what you're doing and any questions. The community of Watsonville who sees your freight um, has questions or concerns about, so that's an opportunity for you for a venue. And um, I, I know that many of my questions were already asked about the number of, of businesses. Um, even those that don't really want train have found a way that they could be utilizing this type of service for freight. And I, I think that that's an opportunity for some creativity of, of using this modality um, in, our, in our area. Um, our council's very pleased with um, the removal of a lot of the rail cars and um, has the patience to see that you're actually doing what you say that you were gonna do based on the contract and the concerns that our community has had. So I commend you for all of that productivity that's there and look forward to being able to see more um, businesses um, catch on to use your service. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Chair. So you're talking about less carbon and fewer trips on Highway 1 uh, based on the amount of um, uh, trucks that you would take off the highway. How many, how many uh, vehicle trips come and go on Highway 1 and how many, uh, what is the reduction of trucks and is it statistically significant? I just want to know raw numbers. How many people travel on Highway 1 and how many trucks you would take off? And Because you're talking a lot about carbon. You're talking about a lot about environmental benefits. I want to know if it's statistically significant. We can both answer that. But my short answer is we can do it from the, if you will, from the destination end out. So we don't have data on trucks on that highway, but we do have data on what's happening in your communities here. So we can tell you how many car loads are being brought into the area, and that just does the math backwards for how many trucks are being eliminated. And we can do that quarterly, like you had asked, or even biannual or annually. So that's easily done. So what do you got? Well, and again, you know, when we inherited this, it was less than 100 some cars here. That's all that was happening. So we're just getting started with the drumbeat, if you will, of the existing customers, things that are happening. So. Today, you know, there's the obvious customers that we're handling today, but there's a lot of onboard ones that are happening real time. So that will be borne out in the future meetings where we can show you how many cars are coming in, rail cars, and then you just take it times four, and that's the less monitor. I'm trucks. not talking about rail cars. I'm talking about the end product. Namely, you're saying that because of your activity and maybe future passenger rail, significant numbers of trucks would be, taking off, be, be taken off the road and improve the traffic on Highway 1. So I'm wondering, how many does that represent? How many, how many trucks are gonna be taken off the road and uh, w with uh, respect to how many cars are traveling there and is it significant? It, well, some of this is all speculative on making that conversion, <laughs> but if we were to uh, increase our volume, say additional 400 car loads, then you're looking at almost 1,600 truckloads. And then there is, a, there is a model calculator that you can calculate origin and destination to come up with a carbon number of tons of carbon that you can take out. So you mentioned uh, the follow-up meetings we would have in terms of the number of, of new businesses, opportunities, and car, you know, cars that we've brought on. At that point would be a good time to sit down and go, this actually equates to X number of truckloads. These are the origins and destinations that they were taking off that were, that were formerly moving on Highway 1 and this is the amount of carbon that was, that was reduced. So you, there it is measurable. So you're saying 400 car, 400 car loads that would travel from north to south on this corridor uh, based on your business model? Well, let's say someone's moving something from Chicago to Watsonville and it was moving by truck and it came down Highway 1. We would be able to tell you exactly how much uh, in terms of the, the, the equation between truck to rail it took four, four and a half trucks for no, every I rail car. I, forgive me, I realize the equation part of it, okay. But I'm looking for the actual reduction on Highway 1 based on your business model of, of, of transporting product. And I, I guess my, what I'm saying is that it, you, you keep saying mm -hmm. that uh, carbon, uh, less carbon, it's better for the environment, but statistically, it's just such a small infinitesimal amount of truck 
traffic that you take off the road that I wouldn't value it so much. Uh, I have another question. You're talking about um, at some point wanting to participate and be part of a passenger rail system in Santa Cruz County. And uh, to your credit, you boasted the fact that right now you're doing work on the rail line at your expense, okay? Would you, be, would you be doing the same thing at your expense if you're gonna use that rail line for your benefit for excursions and so forth, or would you expect the, the taxpayers to do it? Passenger rail is, is unique differently than freight. So passenger is generally done in collaboration between government, local, railroad as a, a collaborative effort. Uh, you, you're not, I'm not aware of any passenger system in America where it can be funded by itself based on tickets. So you do have to have a collaboration. It's just the cost to make it work, to make it functional, and the equipment and the assets. It's a different model than freight. Okay, last question, sorry. Um, so you, you're talking about expanding your business model up north all the way up to, to Santa Cruz. Give me f five of the, the businesses that you would hope to engage and use your, use your uh, uh, cars system or whatever to quote take traffic off of Highway One. Well, the obvious ones are construction lumber. Where's you that at? What what business is that? Well, we'll just to say lumber. I don't want to mention company names. So you've got lumber, you've got landscape materials, you've got you've got water treatment materials that come in for the water plants that are best to be moved by rail. You've got all sorts of different uh, landscape and soil admixtures, heavy bulky things. Uh, that's that's what we see is that type of product. Well, it's that type of product, but are there that many businesses that would conform to your business model to make it worthwhile? Yeah, no, we've, we've been talking okay. very much so. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Schifrin, or uh, Ms. Brown. Thank you. So I think, um, thank you for the presentation and for coming out. Um, I appreciate you taking the time and providing us with some information. I think some of the questions and concerns that I'm hearing from my colleagues here are uh, get, speak to uh, some of the questions and concerns I have, which is um, in particular wanting to see some evidence, some actual data to uh, demonstrate some of the assertions you're making. I have no reason to doubt them, but I also um, have some, you know, some questions, and so it would be really helpful for us to get some additional information from you in writing, um, some some evidence that um, we are seeing some of these reductions in traffic, uh, the the some assessment of the contribution to the local economy, um, you know, not in terms of jobs created, jobs that are going, you know, local hiring processes, for example. I mean, it's it's one thing to hear that, and um, you know, with all due respect, no no disrespect meant, um, but to actually understand what that means would be helpful for us. So some kind of report about that in, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, amount of time, six months, whatever seems reasonable, would really help us be assured that what you say is happening is happening. You know, we can sort of anecdotally see it. Um, you know, Ms. Kaufman Gomez is in Watsonville, so it's probably closer to it than some of us. Um, but that would be really helpful. I, um, you know, it would be interested to know, um, again, that process of local hiring um, in for construction and maintenance, also for your operations, you know, who is working in, you know, for, for Progressive directly through subcontracts? Um, are you getting uh, former UP and, and IP employees who are shifting over and continuing to do the work, et cetera? So, so just some better understanding of that would be really helpful for us. Um, and I would also be interested while you're here to, and again, I know this is prospective and you're working on expanding the business and longer term planning, but just your plans for moving, uh, f you know, rail cars through the county. Uh, I understand you're focusing on the Watsonville freight service right now, um, but as you proceed, what, what that looks like, um, and with all the investment that you're making, uh, you know, which is much appreciated um, into our local economy, um, how you anticipate um, getting to an economically viable, I mean, I know you've given us some of that, but just kind of where you're at right now and where you see yourselves going. Well, to, to respect of the, the reporting, we use a service called RMI, which is owned by General Electric. So every car that comes into any station point is recorded, and it's a great impartial fact-based report of every car that has a station point of Watsonville 
or Santa Cruz, whatever it's gonna be. So we can pull those reports at any time and bring them into a quarterly, biannual, whatever meeting. And then the carbon calculation that Phil spoke to is really easy because then we can go to the you know, actual carbon calculator and say here's the tons of carbon because of this amount of activity during this quarter. So that's more than happy to do that. And I think that's something that, you know, probably quarterly would be a good thing to do. Yeah. Just, you know, more is better, right? So, and then we can give you our employment roster, we can give you what we're doing in the spend, the capital spend, we're open book. So we can break it down to like four or five metrics and just start comparing and then graphing them. Okay. Uh, Mr. Schifrin, then. Thank you very much for your presentation and for your uh, patience and for not mentioning the fact that the commission has not approved a contract stay in Watsonville and, t and won't until it makes a decision on the impact curve study. So the fa in fact, you're operating with a cloud over your business in Santa Cruz County because the, you know, the commission in making the contract with you made it very clear that that contract would not be finalized or go on beyond uh, decision on the Unified Corridor Study unless the Commission agreed to continue it at that time. Um, so I think, from my perspective, asking a lot of questions about what you're doing and what you're going to do is a little bit unfair at this point since the Commission hasn't even decided that it wants to have you as the, an operator on the line. And I think once, it seemed to me a little bit difficult to run a business when you don't know whether you're going to be in business in a particular community after the next months, plus the fact that your contract was only signed, I think, about six or seven months ago. So I think um, we may have expectations of uh, your company that may be a little bit unrealistic at this point. Um, if the commission uh, on January, in January, I hope, makes a decision on the Unified Court of Study, and if that decision is to uh, you know, keep the contract with Progressive Rail and have it uh, be go into the future uh, for the length, the length of the contract, then I think it becomes more relevant for the Commission to start dem demanding uh, reports on what you're doing. Uh, the other thing, and I, I guess I have really two questions. One question has to do with the potential of service to the rest of Santa Cruz County, um, should the Commission decide to retain the rest of rail. All right. Yeah, is your microphone on? Where is the the bottom? The, the hit the green button at the bottom. Is it lit up? Press the button. Itself. Press the button. The gray, gray button. on the top. Yeah. Hello, hello. Oh, that happens. Hello. There we go. Okay, sorry. So my questions: Should the commission decide to continue the contract with Progressive Rail uh, and allow the company to expand service beyond Watsonville? My understanding is there's still a good deal of work that has to be done on the line before it's going to be possible to run trains on it. Do you have any estimate based on any analysis that you've done uh, as to how long it would take be before it will be possible physically to run a, uh, a train on the, a freight train on the line, uh, assuming that you, do, you are able to uh, achieve customers up in the north part of the county? Thank you. So there is a meeting today, I believe, with the Army Corps on the washout. I, I can't answer that because the Army Corps is going to drive that decision as far as the permitting and as far as the sequencing. I believe there's only a two-month window to do the work, and that's coming up in the fall or early or late summer. So it's a question I can't answer with certainty. I can just say there's a process going on to get that repaired and the washout fixed. But, you know, it's been an ongoing process for quite a while, and the Army Corps has been slow to respond and they're needed in the process. So if I'm understanding correctly, it doesn't make any sense for the commission to ask for reports on the business in the rest of the county, even assuming it approves the contract, since it's not gonna be possible to, for you to serve any businesses for at least a year. Well, we're, we're actually hopeful that can go faster than that and take advantage of the window coming up. So you're gonna have a window this, this late summer falls, from what I understand. So that it's not a large repair once that design and engineering is done and agreed upon. So we hope to be through it quicker, but stay tuned. The meeting is happening, I believe, today. The second question I have has to do with uh, other kinds of transit on the line. 
you've uh, talked about the possibility of working with the commission if, if passenger, passenger rail ever becomes feasible in the future. Uh, one of the options that's going to be before the commission is uh, the relationship with the uh, bus system and the possibility of having bus rapid transit on the rail line. Are you familiar with uh, examples where it's been possible to run freight with bus rapid transit uh, using the rail line for uh, bus type vehicles that could also ride on streets uh, as well as uh, with uh, freight? That's a product that you don't see a lot in America. Uh, some foreign countries have something like that, but uh, I'm aware of it. It's, it's something that's a ways out. Um, we're not into the buses. We'd be anything with a steel wheel, and we're supportive of passenger service. But in our mode and what we do is, is with rail cars. But if the bus is a better alternative, let's have a discussion. For sure. We're open. We want what you want. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Caput. Yeah, thank you for being here. And uh, with the state interest, uh, uh, state money, of course, and the interest of connecting uh, uh, Salinas, Gilroy, and I've heard that uh, Monterey is going to try to connect also to uh, all these different, uh, you know, cities, and then a connection with Pajaro, which would be Watsonville, and that would be a connection with all of Santa Cruz County. Uh, how, how does that impact uh, progressive rail as far as the interest of connecting all these other cities with Pajaro and then, of course, Santa Cruz and Davenport? It, it's a great question. So you have curfews, you have passengers run at a certain point in freight at the opposite point. So the two can live together in harmony. So in many, many cases across America, you've got your passenger windows and then freight runs opposite. So they can work together. Yeah, that, that would increase your... Uh, uh, freight and po and possibly in the future passenger service greatly. Yep, more activity breeds activity for sure. Right. Okay. And the uh, the other questions I had were already answered. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. McPherson. Hello. Uh, good morning. Thank you for being here. I appreciate, I appreciate your presentation. Uh, I'm a, a metro uh, a member of the metro, um, and in that formula, the the passenger fare. Um, is usually covers about 22 to 25 percent. And you were talking about if we got into the passenger service, uh, it's a collaborative effort. Is there any kind of, uh, is there a formula for you that what percentage of uh, the fares would cover, should cover the cost in that kind of a situation on rail? Well, it's interesting. If you look at Amtrak, you know, the fares that they collect pays to run the railroad, but it does nothing for capital. So they can run the trains with what you pay up the fare with Amtrak, but there's no money for station improvements, there's no money for rail cars, there's no money for locomotives, or for significant track. Amtrak's a unique bird because they're running on the freight railroads railroad and they're paying a fee. So that's not even a true example, so they're not even being burdened by that, but usually the fares at best cover the operating, and then many times you're right at that 20, 22%, so that's where the collaboration comes from. But it's got to be honest, it's expensive, and that's where it has to be a barn-raising effect. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Botto. <clears throat> okay, great. First of all, I want to thank you both for taking the trip out here and coming in person and making this presentation. Uh, I want to remind the, the public especially that um, what we had prior to the contract with Progressive, although it's a limited contract, was a failing railroad service and lots of complaints from the community about storage cars, lack of maintenance. And I want to acknowledge that since you've been here, you know, you first started moving the cars and doing the maintenance and I appreciate that. And I really want to stay away from the speculation about where we're going because as Mr. Schiffer mentioned, you're operating on a contract that we haven't even consummated yet for, for long-term plans, which makes it pretty hard to make those plans. I do acknowledge that I know personally people that you've reached out to with businesses that and trying to solicit additional freight service in Watsonville and other areas. So that's what you told us you were going to do. So I just want to leave with the comments that, you know, so far as I'm far as I'm concerned, you came here and you've done what you've said and I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, uh, first of all, I will also uh, thank you for being here, although I realize how cold it is in Minnesota and so today looks pretty good. 
if that's your work day and you're from Minnesota. Um, <laughs> The, uh, we've had lots of conversations over the last couple of months uh, about our future transportation planning. And one of the things that comes up is uh, the possibility of passenger rail and freight service coexisting. And in your other lines, do you have um, passenger service and your freight service coexisting? In Minnesota, in other areas of the Midwest, you don't have that density of the cities like you have here. It's pretty rural. Um, maybe close to the Twin Cities, but we just got light rail in the Twin Cities a few years ago. Had, you know, great controversy, as you can imagine, every time a rail line is being installed. But today, no, we don't share rail with passengers just because of our geography. Yeah, and is, uh, but you've expressed here, but I just want to confirm, uh, you'd be willing to work with passenger service and uh, with your freight service here. Absolutely, and you know we would like to even be part of the passenger service itself as far as the operations of the trains, and we want to invest in the community. We're excited to be here, and there's a lot more that can be done. We have just scratched the surface of what can be done here. Well, I appreciate uh, the comments. Um, oh, Mr. Mulhern. I also appreciate the comments and I appreciate your willingness to come out here so often and engage with us in the community. It speaks highly of your business model. So thank you so much. Um, just to uh, some of the points that have been made um, regarding the uh, administration coordination and license agreement we have with you. Uh, when we approved that ACL uh, that, that gave Progressive Rail the right to run freight service along the, the full uh, freight easement which is uh, the, to milepost 31.39. So were the tracks in a condition to run trains, they could conceivably run freight all the way up to Davenport. Um, it's just that our rail line, obviously, with the washout at milepost five, you can't run any trains at all. But once that's resolved, we could conceivably have freight along the entire corridor. Um, then, but regarding, uh, Phase two of that agreement, which is for transportation services, uh, there is a 120-day shot clock that started on November 15th. Uh, today, we're 21 days into that shot clock for making a decision about initiating transportation services. Um, do we have any idea when we might vote on that, on initiating transportation services? Uh, March 15th is the 120-day, uh, the end of the 120-day period. Um, January 17th is 63 days into that window. Do we have any idea when we might see a vote? Yeah. Well, I'm looking at Luis, but uh, whoever, yeah, yeah any, anybody. Yeah. Well, uh, commissioners, as you know, you do have a January 17th meeting uh, where you uh, took action to um, uh, consider the Unified Quarter Investment Study uh, and that will, you know, determine you know, the decision that you make on that study will determine uh, then what sort of decision you can make about that agreement with Progressive Rail. So you could potentially make the decision at that meeting, or it could be, you know, at a later meeting. Uh, and you, as, as pointed out, you have until March uh, to be able to do that. So, Mr. Bertrand. So Andy got me thinking. Um, uh, you might want to check if uh, your microphone is on. Thank you, Tina. So my questions are based on two things. Recognition that you're in Santa Cruz and there's certain expectations for the community here. And I think you've addressed that. And I think everyone on this commission, since um, we're elected and we run campaigns, we respond to the public and you're part of that now. Um, the other thing is whether or not um, you do well in your marketing progress, uh, your marketing plans, right? I've been in marketing, and I know when I talk to my boss, the year looks great, <laughs> you know, and I got a lot of customers to feed the funnel, you know, but only a few come out the bottom. So uh, maybe uh, a shorter period of time for a report would be good, especially before we make a decision on doing the whole line. Um, my main focus really is on Watsonville. I think there's, there's a lot of potential here. Uh, there's a lot of people in Watsonville that are willing to be a part of the, the rail solution. Uh, potentially, it could uh, magnify our, abil our ability to market, uh, the various customers here that you would call customers, their ability to market. Um, one customer um, did write a letter to us and talked about how um, rail might be unfeasible, and I think they're in produce that's very perishable. 
Um, how would you address those concerns? I'm not sure you're aware of that, but um, they try to get their product out in a very short period of time, and trucks seem to be the only way to actually do that. There's some issues with uh, transit using rail. Um, is this something you're familiar with? And it seemed, it's a major customer in our area. So. Uh, yes, when we understand there's certain products um, that today probably wouldn't be f feasible, that we, we think there's other things uh, that probably be easier to go and, and look at first. Um, to, to the, on the commercial side, there's things we need to prove to the customers okay. uh, that, that, that we can handle this, and then we kind of move up, no pun intended, the food chain to look at uh, the, the more perishable, time-sensitive products. Um, but there, as, as the rail industry progresses, things that weren't thought to be able to ever to be move on rail are moving today. So it's it's a it's a constant change changing picture as rail improves its and continues to prove its uh, its a process. Okay. So yeah, <coughs> that we're not going to start at the hardest items first and then yeah. work down. But but we see certainly see that as an opportunity. But we have to we have to prove ourselves first on some of the more uh, obvious products. Okay. Uh, so okay. yes. I want to build in well said, Phil, but there is something to be said about the perishables. We're working with Union Pacific. They have what's called a cold train express. And we're actively working on setting out a block of cars that connects with that train. And uh, how many days is it to the East Coast? Is it four or four, three? Four or five days on that express system. And which is actually better than a team drive with truck. Okay, that's what I want to hear. So we have particular problems here with certain customer base that you would be they would be your customer base. So yep. as long as I hear you're identifying that as a, a solution you want to achieve, I'm, I'm happy. So to me, you know, I said one point, and uh, the mayor is here, and he heard me say this. Um, I think uh, Watsonville is the jewel in this particular mm -hmm. line for you guys, and this is the one that I, I want to see that develop big time. There's jobs for the public. There's uh, magnifying the ability of our um, businesses to market, and that's all a good thing. That's what I'm looking for. The Cold Train Express, why don't you give them a little highlight? You've worked on that. It's, it's how valuable that is to this community. Well, yeah, the, the Union Pacific has a, um, and, and, there's, and the, the rail industry, and we talked about how the rail industry has progressed in terms of their product services that they offer. Uh, but they run trains that are uh, unit trains that run in collaborative with the eastern carriers that run from the west coast to New York. In four or five days, they actually beat truck delivery. Um, and those are very successful. Uh, what we're hoping to work in, with in Watsonville, and Watsonville being a unique place in terms of the amount of cold storage capacity that it has, is to make, and we, we're also not only selling to the customers, but selling to the Class 1 railroads that, hey, we'll, we'll turn your assets, these, these refrigerated boxcars are a quarter of a million dollars a piece. The Union Pacific's gone out and bought 1,200 new ones with an, op with an option for 1,600. So that's a huge investment on their part. Uh, they see that growing. But what we hope to make is Watsonville that kind of a, a center point where they can concentrate those cars and, and even our initial conversations with them is a way to tie Watsonville into that express system. And if we can turn and provide the service not only to our end customers here, but also to the Union Pacific, that's, but then it, that's further down the road. It's, you know, show us first, show us that you can do that. Um, and then also in terms of the destinations, if you have that quarter of a million dollar asset, we're working on already uh, backhauls for those same cars to come back to Watsonville, making both legs of the, of the, the process more competitive, both for, uh, for the Union Pacific, but also the, re the, uh, the local businesses here in Watsonville. Right, exactly. We got one more. So when you look at those customers, the fruit is very important for sure, but it also comes down to the frozen fruit. And we're working on new innovative load designs to get more product in the boxcars, which makes it even more competitive for anyone here that's trying to get their fruit to market, to smuckers or any other people that are consumers of them. So load design is one of the things. Uh, more efficient boxcars we're identifying. We're offering to clean cars for Union Pacific here to become an easy center to get cars in and out fast. That used to be done back in the day in Watsonville. So we're doing a lot of things to be collaborative with the UP, with the customer, with the city, with the transportation board, everybody has got a stake in this to make it successful. But I'll just leave you with this. So all of these customers, the fruit is important, but it's also the plastic resin to make the containers. It's also the pallets. It's everything that's part of that supply chain. And so when you look at that, even the inputs, the fertilizer, the lightweight aggregates, the organic fertilizer, all of that helps them be more competitive in a worldwide market. So 
it's a stepping stone, and we're already working with UP on a cold train. That started, but in the meantime, there is some low-hanging fruit right now that'll make these companies more competitive today. So we're on it. Thanks very much. <coughs> um, Mr. Schifrin. Uh, uh, Patrick raised a concern that I uh, really with, I want to ask Luis about uh, regarding the excursion, uh, excursion requirements in the contract. Um, I, could you remind me what does kick in the time period where uh, uh, excursion service has to be provided? Because I'm, uh, the reason I'm concerned, assuming that the commission decides to go forward with pro uh, progressive rail, um, the line is not available right now. So if there's a short time period under which they could start, they are required to start excursion or have excursion uh, service provided, and it's not possible to run trains on a line, it's not very realistic. So mm -hmm. what does the contract say in terms of uh, when excursion services needs to be mm -hmm. started? Uh, the uh, administration, administration coordination license agreement then gives um, progressive rail 12 months to provide an oper a, a plan uh, to initiate uh, excursion service and, and then you know, and bring it before the commission uh, so the commission can then consider approval of, of that plan, and once they have that that uh, approval, that plan, then they can then they can proceed with that excursion service. So they're only required to bring a plan to the commission, not to start the service. So if yeah. it takes longer to mm -hmm. fix the line than the optimistic uh, estimates from mm -hmm. uh, the company, there is the it, it won't uh, undermine the the contract. It, it, yes. It okay. Would so within that first year, they just need to develop the 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 proposal for providing the service. That's okay, correct. thank you, that's helpful. Um, uh, thank you for the presentation. I know you have to leave like something around 10-15, uh, um, and so I, I, I w wanna open it up for any comments uh, with the recognition with everybody that they have to leave, uh, uh, and I'll give them a moment if there's any questions they could ask, but I really appreciate the effort to be here, to be communicative with uh, uh, our commission um, and we appreciate the way you've been working with the RTC and the community. Thank you, it's a good partnership. Thank yeah. you. Hi, uh, Brian Peoples with Trail Now. Um, first of all, Trail Now supports freight in Watsonville. Freight is, we consider everything south of Lee Road. Um, when we talk about freight into Santa Cruz, I think of the milk carton guy when we were little who used to deliver the milk cart bottles in front of your house, right? Could you imagine? That's kind of what freight is delivering into Santa Cruz. I mean, are we really going to have big freight vehicles delivering milk to our neighborhoods, lumber? I don't think so. Um, one of the things, Greg, this is specifically for you, you do understand the current contract, even if we agree that we're gonna have something other than passenger rail, Watsonville is pretty much out of the loop on an alternative because y you've given away the rights of the v corridor all the way to Milepost 7, which is Buena Vista Road. So you, you, you've given it away. So I would ask that the commission go back to Progressive Rail and say, hey, can we look at an alternative? Because we think we want Watsonville to have alternative transportation, right? Something. Can we get some sidling, sidings, I think they're called, right behind the, you know, right before Lee Road? That would be a great win-win solution. Now we could renegotiate and not give up that valuable Harkin Slough location. So I think that's something that we really want to impress upon you to look at in the way of the contract, working with them. Because it's, we want freight to be successful in Wattsville. It's a great thing. It's, it, it definitely is. Um, the other thing that I want to point out is we will socially talk about any companies that get freight delivered past Lee Road. So San Lorenzo Lumber, 
um, you know, we'll talk about it in the social space. And that's not a good thing, because we're not sacrificing that corridor for fixing our transportation problem for people, for people, for that simple milk run, because San Lorenzo Lumber wants its milk delivered. That doesn't work in this modern age. When we look at the technology of our mobile technology for individuals using rubber tires, we can't sacrifice that for those milk runs to San Lorenzo Lumber or any other little small operator along the rail corridor. Thank you. Could I ask if you're threatening to undermine the business model of San Lorenzo Lumber? Do I get another three minutes? Uh, no, just a quick yes or no would do. I don't know their business model. Does everybody uh, have one of these handouts? Not yet. Okay. You should come forward and speak, or you should let well, the next well, person come that's forward. That's why I handed speak. it out earlier. Okay. Um, this is really good that you guys are here. Uh, Progressive presented their marketing plan, uh, five year marketing plan, and the graphs that you see are directly from that, and I've actually taken their marketing plan and plugged it through the ACL agreement and calculated how much money goes in and goes out, so I'd like people to see it. Basically, I'm going to say this very quickly, which is um, I plotted the, the actual freight done by Iowa Pacific versus what was done by the progressive marketing plan. On the very top graph, their freight is seven times the historical average of Iowa Pacific without counting partial quarters and things like that. This is the actual developed stuff and it actually, it, it coincides with uh, Sierra Northern. Number two, let's go to the next marketing plan which is uh, passenger service. I'm only going to compare the Davenport special or whatever, the coastal train. Uh, you can compare it with the uh, the uh, uh, Polar Express, or there also they did the coastal train. You can see in the orange, the Iowa Pacific is way down there at about 6,000 passengers per, per year. And Progressive is promising by year five, 60,000, okay? So it's 10 times that. I should say to the public that, don't, that doesn't have this graph on the, on the freight, they're offering, they're promising seven times the historical average. So it's, it's uh, it's very optimistic to say an understatement. Lastly, I did run it through the, um, the financial part, that's the graph number three, and I took exactly the numbers, very optimistic numbers of the progressive, including the 140,000 passengers per year coming from San Jose to Santa Cruz. Actually, I should say 70,000 because it'll be a round trip, but I took all their numbers, their revenues, and plugged it through, and I will tell you a couple of things. Freight comes to about $40,000 a year when they are fully up and running. Uh, there's the, the passenger service takes time to get up, but you can see that the, uh, the net loss, if you look at the bar graph, those bars on the bottom, that's the net loss. And the net loss to the county is $15 million over 10 years. So we may like Progressive, but how much are we going to pay to keep Progressive running their railroad? This is net loss, okay? This is not like how much are we spending. So when I say how much are we spending in net loss, uh, I'm including the promises in the contract to fix the tracks uh, so that they can do it. That's the phase two. It's all in there and the estimates are there and, and my minute is gone. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Good morning. Uh, good morning, I'm Jack Carroll, I live in Soquel. Um, I appreciate the presentation today by Progressive Rail, but it talked about Watsonville freight, and I know speaking personally, I have no objection to a robust Watsonville freight service, and I haven't heard any objection to that. It's what happens after Watsonville. It's my understanding that uh, you and I and everybody else in this room has to pay to rehabilitate those tracks past Watsonville. And so I think it's a perfectly reasonable question to ask what possible benefit 
is available to the businesses and the, the taxpayers of Santa Cruz before we spend the sizable amount to rehabilitate those tracks. I happen to be walking on them this weekend and let me tell you, they are in sad shape. There's also been a subject, a question about um, how freight and passenger service uh, will work together. And I wanna read a couple of expert excerpts from the agreement that has been signed. Uh, there's a definition of transportation services. It's paragraph 1.17. And it specifically says that transportation service does not include regularly scheduled mass transit or commuter service. I don't think you asked for that. I suspect they asked for that. There's also a paragraph 2.3 that's headed and underlined, no material interference with freight service. So I think that kind of agrees with what Progressive has told you, that they're in the freight business and uh, passenger business is, um, well, they say it won't be a problem, but we have a single track that goes two ways for both passenger and freight. And um, evidently, somebody wrote into this operating agreement that you guys signed that uh, if there is a problem, passenger service loses. And regarding uh, the excursion trains, uh, my reading of the contract says that um, Progressive has three years from perfect rails to run one excursion train a year. The fourth year they have to run two, the fifth year they have to run three. Now, uh, I'm sorry our Caltrans representative isn't here, uh, but I don't think that's what the state of California thinks of as passenger rail service, to run a holiday train for the rather wealthy visitors to Santa Cruz to uh, go someplace. Um, I, uh, I'm sure it's not legally fraud, but it certainly seems like ludicrous, and when we're asked to pay $100 million to make it possible, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't see the logic of that. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, mm -hmm. Stanley Sokolow. Um, I have two issues that I'm concerned about. Um, if we're gonna be uh, running passenger trains every 30 minutes, both directions, sort of staggered and they pass somewhere al along the way. Um, how does that interleave with freight? Does the freight run just at night after the passenger service <coughs> ends, like from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. Or, or what? How do they picture interleaving passenger commuter service with their freight? And the second issue is, um, the time window for making the decision to go ahead with them for passenger service or whatever that time window is, 120 days or whatever. I thought that starts when the, the Unified Corridor Study has been completed and a recommendation is made. Isn't that what was the language in the contract? No, what the what triggered the start? When staff recommendation was made. Has the staff recommendation actually been completed or it's still in flux? Because I see the Metro is asking for more studies as those the UCS is not completed. So that, those are my issues. I'm Ryan Sarnataro from Live Oak. Uh, it's pretty obvious that there's two different um, operating issues here. One of them has to do with Watsonville. Everybody's in favor of freight in Watsonville. Progressives uh, investing in it. The other one has to do with the rest of the corridor. And uh, when Progressive came out here the first time, uh, I spoke with Craig McKenzie about the fact that there are two different zones here that we uh, that we're concerned about. And I urged him to come up with a contract that had a clean out for the passenger or the northern part of the uh, of the rail corridor. The fact that you folks have a contract in your hands that does not give our county an, an easy option to say, great, do your progressive rail uh, freight service to Watsonville and, uh, and let us work out what we wanna do with the, with the rest of the rail corridor. 
I think that was a profound disservice to, to the county on the part of whoever it was that created and negotiated the contract. Now, name calling aside, you're gonna be faced with a decision here which is going to, if you're going to try and preserve the rail corridor for any kind of use, whether it's, whether it's a bus, whether it's a bicycle, um, you're going to need to cancel this contract and renegotiate with Progressive Rail. And it seems to me that, uh, you know, that, that makes it distasteful to say, yeah, we're gonna just throw that out. But uh, as you can see by the uh, amount of investment that Progressive is putting in here, and also what I believe is their, their good faith belief that there's a, a lot of uh, volume that can be moved out of Watsonville, I think Progressive will go for it. You, you have the strength in the negotiating position to cancel this contract and get a contract that only operates freight out of Watsonville. And so I'm certainly urging the commission to do that. Um, it, it would be, I would be interested to understand the process by which you were not provided that as a clean alternative. Uh, but nonetheless, that's what you've got. We now have a, a you know, new leadership coming to the, uh, to the RTC, and I, and I hope that the new leadership understands community concerns to the point where they actually negotiate, and sometimes negotiate hard, to give the community the opportunity to take the time that it needs in order to actually come up with the best solutions for, for this quarter. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Buzz Anderson, I'm a uh, resident of Live Oak also, have owned, uh, grew up in Capitola and own a business there for the past 35 years. Uh, the, the, the letter from Progressive Rail to this commission is an example of the type of unneeded bias that continues to be part of this process. First, Progressive Rail is biased to advocate for its freight business, so why are they given a perch by our staff to opine on Santa Cruz County's transportation issues? More importantly, Progressive's letter of October 24th is full of incorrect information. Progressive claims that it will reduce truck traffic needed for consumer goods like food products, lumber, and roofing materials, as well as inputs to manufacturing and municipal water treatment systems. We have had two failed train operators, Sierra Northern and Iowa Pacific. They failed because the freight north of Watsonville is not economic. The materials in North County referenced by Progressive Rail are peanuts for a thriving rail line. Inputs to manufacturing, what manufacturing? In reality, if Progressive does bring in customers and new manufacturing plants to the Santa Cruz Watsonville corridor, then we will see more trucks on the highway, not fewer. Progressive also claims they will convert a significant volume of car traffic to passenger rail. Really? The rail transport, transport transit feasibility study shows low ridership. Even the general manager of SMART said his train has had no impact on Highway 101 traffic in Sonoma and Marin counties. Progressive claims will need excursion trains as a transition to passenger rail. We're gonna tie up the coastal corridor for 10 years when there's little freight north of Watsonville based on this type of analysis. I strongly urge you to do the alternatives analysis requested by Metro and delay any decision, decision on the US UCS until this is completed. The only thing a January 17th UCS decision will do is lock up the corridor for 10 years and take transportation options off the table. Let's focus progressive rail on the freight that exists in Watsonville South and explore the right mix of active transportation and public transit on the corridor. Anything else is reckless and biased. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning. Good morning, Gail McNulty. And for the record, I no longer speak for Greenway. I speak for my children and for all of the children who are not in this room today, but who will have to live with the decisions that this agency makes. You are putting an incredible amount of trust in this out-of-state company, and you are doing this naively. With too little information, you are putting our transportation options and potentially the welfare of the people of this county and our beautiful surroundings at risk. That is not okay. These gentlemen are good salesmen and they're good at making money as Mr. Bator found out on his trip out west. <laughs> they're also in an industry that is heavily protected by our federal government. 
Their team members, including Mr. Fallon and Mr. McKenzie, are well versed in the fossil fuel industry, which is, by the way, the perhaps the only industry currently profiting on the U.S. rails. And California, for all of our wonderful sustainability, is the third biggest producer of fossil fuels. So I ask you to stop and think for a minute. Why do these gentlemen want to be here so badly? Why did they start reaching out to our county last summer before we put out an RFP? Why, have, how many of you have actually seen the proposal that they gave to this agency in October, which was very, very, very different than the one that the public saw in January? How many of you have looked at the page in that proposal that talked about the hazardous industries they specialize in? How many of you have looked closely at their website to see what they do, what they move in other places? How many of you have looked at what their industry in connection with the frac sand industry has done to the state of Wisconsin? And how much have you really thought about how this will affect Watsonville? Think carefully. Think very, very carefully. I've heard a lot of skepticism in the room today about this company being able to profit, and quite honestly, that's not what I'm worried about. I would love for them to come here and fail because that's our best case scenario. If these gentlemen come here and actually turn a profit, it's gonna be by doing what they said they would do when we were in Scotts Valley. They said they would bring out-of-state customers here. How many of you have questioned them? Mr. Schifrin, you think it's okay to not know who these customers are? My children don't think that's okay, all right? I wanna know what they think they can do to make a profit here because it's not the lumber and it's not the produce. Those industries have already said there's not that much business there and we've watched other companies fail trying to move that. So ask more questions, please. Thank you. Good morning. Hi, <clears throat> I'm sorry. just sit here and cry for two minutes. <laughs> if you'd like to uh, uh, wait till someone no, else speaks. No, I'm just gonna, I'll, I'll say very little. I stayed up till 11 o'clock preparing something and I'm not gonna read it. <laughs> so that means I only slept for five hours and I'll be on the road for three hours transporting my kids back and forth to PCS. <laughs> but I am here representing Green Line and I do have two questions. There's a question um, on the contract that seems to read that if Progressive Rail actually is uh, successful in their endeavors, that that would actually take precedent over any sort of transportation um, use of the rail. So I have a question about that. <clears throat> and I also have a question. Um, there's a letter in a packet that was produced, I think, in June where Agron was uh, asking uh, for the signing of a contract with Progressive Rail, and they seem to be very interested in transporting biofuels through this rail company, and I've heard no mention of them, so I'm really curious as to why that hasn't come up. And if they are gonna be transporting um, biofuels in our community, <laughs> We just had a terrible fire not so far from here. <laughs> that really scared the hell out of me and my kids. And to not acknowledge that that could potentially happen in our community through the transportation of very highly flammable product really bothers me and it concerns me and I really need you to pay a little bit closer attention to what is about or not about to happen here. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Karina McFarlane, um, Live Oak resident. And just to say that um, 
I love Highway 1. It's always empty. It's never congested <laughs> because I see my clients. I say, I won't see you after 2 o'clock in the afternoon or I'll schedule you at 7.30 in the evening and I do two more sessions after. So that's my workaround. And so my point is that Anyone could truck anything in the hours that I'm on Highway 1 to Watsonville Freight. Bless their heart. Thank God they're there. But don't make freight up through North County. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Bud Colligan, Live Oak resident. Um, I'd first like to remind the commission that we've had two failed operators, Sierra Northern and Iowa Pacific. Why did they fail? Lack of freight business. Um, we've had consultants from the RTC, our RTC own studies that doubted the economic viability of freight in this corridor. I'm not talking about Watsonville freight, I'm talking about freight in North County. And nothing has changed in the Santa Cruz economy. In fact, it's moved in the other direction to more services. We have no heavy industry. Lumber for ProBuild? Come on, guys. This is not serious. Um, we have no manufacturing here. We can't move produce. We've got letters from Driscoll stating that the cold car is not a viable solution. We hear a lot of happy talk from Progressive Rail about trucks off Highway 1 and off Highway 17. Commission, we have the data. We have four years of data, Mr. Schifrin. Go look at it from Iowa Pacific. You can see the number of cars and truckloads that have actually been moved in this county. It's not a mystery. Let's go look at the data from the last four years. How many of those truckloads were in North County? And lastly, I agree with our ability to negotiate agreements. There's widespread agreement on doing something uh, for Watsonville and keeping freight operations working there. Why don't we have a contract to do that? Why don't we try and find a consensus among this county instead of trying to continue this divisive debate? And I'll end with one thing because we've forgotten a lot about federal preemption. You know we have a CEQA lawsuit against Progressive Rail and against the RTC that's going to be heard by Judge Burdick next week. I just want to read one statement from the Progressive Rail brief on that. This court lacks subject matter jurisdiction over St. Paul's freight operations, which are exclusively regulated by the STB. Petitioner chose to ask this court to tread on STB's exclusive jurisdiction and issue a ruling that would invade St. Paul's federally authorized freight operations. I repeat, federally authorized freight operations. So buyer beware, this is the entanglement that we've gotten into with the Progressive Rail contract. We have been poor negotiators. We can do something south of Watsonville. Let's solve our community's problems and not contribute to further problems going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kathy Marino. I haven't prepared anything. Um, I'm a native of Watsonville. My family first moved to Santa Cruz County 160 years ago. Um, and I want you and Progressive to know that not everyone in Santa Cruz County uses histrionics and threats to try to protect their whatever they are thinking about, I don't know. Because I have a background in some pretty basic engineering, but I worked doing electrical estimating and engineering, and I know a lot about right-of-ways, and I know the value of our rail quarter. I also know that rail is changing, and greenhouse gases in our Earth's environment, everything is changing, and we need rail and trail. Uh, we need options, um, widening the highway, it might have to happen, but it's gonna be much more expensive and a lot less safe and a lot worse for the environment than if we can get passenger rail and freight. Um, I wanna just applaud you for being patient and putting up 
with all of this. And I want you to know that there is a large bunch of people that know what you're doing and appreciate what you're doing and appreciate what they're doing. Progressive is doing what it said it was going to do and it's doing it well. Um, especially Wattsville, which has my heart, you know. Um, and I think everybody can benefit from, especially as me, when I get older, and I'm getting older, everybody can benefit from rail. Um, and they just, a lot of people don't want a train going by their backyard, and a lot of people want to use that land instead, anyhow, to sell or whatever. But their motives, they think might be altruistic, but, but I think we have to think about what's best for everybody. And anyhow, thank you for your patience and putting up with all this. Thank you. My, my name is Barry Scott, and I'm, I live in Aptos, and I'm, uh, I just want to thank the commission for their vote in June to bring uh, Progressive Rail into town, and, uh, and I want to thank uh, St. Paul and Pacific Railroad Company for the remarkable amount of work that they're doing to restore uh, a condition to our rail line. Uh, that it, that it should be in, and, and I see nothing but progress. How impressive is it that they've been doing this without the phase two of the contract? I really hope phase two will, will come into being next early next year. Um, I wanna speak to the process too. You know, we bought a working rail line using rail transit money, and uh, we, we, you know, and uh, began a journey to, to do studies, to, to test, uh, alternative modes, and we're, we're, we've reached a point where we have the Unified Quarters Investment Study that uh, opponents to rail transit insisted upon. And we've looked at it in so many different ways, and there, it's unquestionable that, that rail transit is the direction that we should pursue. But we need the freight easement to remain operational because it's, it's that very federal protection that keeps it preserved for our future use. Will we have rail transit next year and in, in five years and 10 years? I don't know, but if we ever, ever give up that freight easement, we'll lose our options forever. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, Diana Adamick, a committee member. Um, Progressive Rail is a choo-choo train, and choo-choo trains belong running around a Christmas tree on the living room floor, not going through Santa Cruz County. I am not on the side of Greenway or rails or trails or any of those. I'm for a for forward-moving solution to all our problems. I do think that we, we de definitely need public transportation, and I'm a big supporter of trains and public transportation with trains, but this is not the solution to pe moving people. It's an embarrassment to think that we're gonna have progressive rail choo-choo trains coming through Santa Cruz County. As a lover of this city, I do not have any pride in telling people, come to my city. We have this really noisy, dirty, filthy train coming through that does absolutely nothing for you as a tourist. What I'd like us to see is to put some investment in the future with real technology. We are the home of UCSC. We have really good brains here. We can come with something a little bit better. We definitely need bike trails. We need a lot safer ways to commute via the bicycles. We need better ways to walk. We need to fix the, 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 the sidewalks as well because it's ridiculous that we have so few walkable streets around here. And all that is connected to the train situation. We cannot have any sort of reasonable train transportation without addressing sidewalks, biking to and from the trails, trains, what's gonna happen with our parking to the trains, to and from the trains. And the noise pollution we know is a really big problem all over this world as well, and those trains do not solve anything. They are going to add to a lot of stress and um, difficulties here in the city. I am not against putting a public moving sort of tr tr train um, situation on the corridor. If that's viable with getting people to and from here, for example, there's just no way I would take a train to this meeting <laughs> back and forth because there's no way to get there. But if it's, if it's a, a bike trail, that might be a better option, but the main thing is, it's ridiculous an embarrassment to even think that this committee would consider having a choo-choo train coming through this city, doing nothing really for the, no real benefits. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else? Ah. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Sure, uh, Lowell Hurst, Mayor of Watsonville. You know, I didn't come all this way up here not to speak. <laughs> 
It, it only took an hour to get here. <laughs> Surely we uh, all agree in the room that uh, freight, well, almost everybody agrees that freight to Watsonville is a good idea. The businesses uh, along the corridor think it's a good idea. I think uh, the agricultural industry would could benefit by uh, uh, large volumes of uh, organic fertilizer and soil amendments and uh, products that they use in their shipping and packaging and such. And, and it's been acknowledged that not everything is uh, gonna survive a, a rail trip, but apple juice can in a bottle. So there's a real need but there's also a need for Watsonville folks to get to Santa Cruz a, a, in a more expeditious manner. Whether it's by rail or road, I think there's great hope uh, to increase the opportunities for folks to get together and understand each other better. There seems to be some kind of polarization sometimes. And maybe a, a better transportation connection might be able to fix some of that at least build some understanding, but we need to build an economy too. So I remember when I worked out of Buena Vista, I saw the train go by with lumber, with uh, rock products, with cement, with uh, all kinds of things that were on the track. Taking trucks off the road is an important item. Providing an efficient flow for freight and passengers is an important item. And so I say, move forward, be bold, be brave. Let's look for the future and, and let's get Santa Cruz moving. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Anyway, let, can I s say something there, Lowell? <laughs> uh, you remember those trains, uh, but you, do you also, so we go back far enough to remember elephants and uh, lions and everything coming there on the circus to Watsonville <laughs> a long time ago. Okay, that's how far we go back. <laughs> All right, when giants walked among us. Uh, uh, so now we're going to go return to our uh, regularly scheduled um, uh, agenda. Uh, the next item we have is oral communications. And so um, a, a couple things that I want to say before we start oral communications. We are, we're going to limit it to no more than a half hour. Uh, in, if, uh, if people still want to speak, there'll be time at the end of the meeting. Um, and since we just did the, tr the train and we have the unified quarter study on there. I'm gonna try to be very, uh, uh, try to keep people to the items that aren't on the agenda. So please come forward for oral communication. Uh, Mr. Chair, since we have our uh, new director here, I think it's important to be reminded of the rules of uh, public communication. And I think it's, uh, it's the role of the chair to stop people when they um, s call out individual members of the commission. The public is to talk to the commission as a whole, not to individuals. Somebody wants to tell me what I should do, I'm happy to talk to them after the meeting. But I don't think it's appropriate when a talk, and I think it's a, not really the rules to sort of single out a particular member of the commission and um, address comments to that person. So I, if you agree, I, 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 I would I appreciate I appreciate the that. reminder. Okay, uh, thank you. So uh, I, I will remind uh, our <coughs> audience that to address the entire commission. Good morning, Mr. Nelson. Good morning, kind commissioners. Uh, my name is Jack Nelson. I'm a retired land use planner and environmental planner. Uh, when I first began working for the County of Santa Cruz Planning Department, I was geographically located just down through this floor and over that way a little bit. And across the cubicle aisle at that time from uh, planners with the Transportation Commission. Um, so in that time, I, I, well maybe I'll just skip past that and speak to what happened when I retired. I, I saw that I still had a mission to speak to our future and uh, so you've heard me come here and talk about uh, my concerns about climate change. Well, uh, what's happening today at this hour uh, in Katowice, Poland, 
the uh, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change has, is more or less wrapping up its uh, conference meeting today, um, uh, the Conference of Parties on Climate Change. Katowice, Poland is in southern Poland in, in coal country, and uh, I think it's not coincidental that it's located about 20 miles away from Auschwitz. Auschwitz being the site of the, uh, some of the Holocaust uh, that the Nazis perpetrated in World War II. I was there in 1977 after uh, attending a, a conference of uh, Cold War peace advocates in Warsaw. And what I saw was the leftovers of Holocaust. Uh, I, I wonder how much the uh, participants at that climate conference are thinking of the next Holocaust. I know they are. Uh, but the last Holocaust was cruel and in your face intentional. The coming Holocaust a climate of climate, if we don't uh, avoid it, um, will be a Holocaust of incremental mix out of our future. Uh, yeah, again, your commission, and uh, welcome to your new executive director, Mr. Preston. Uh, your commission and your staff are among the most potent authorities we have to determine what Santa Cruz County does about this potential next Holocaust. And uh, is, is that just a scientific question? No, it's also a moral question. Moral philosophers who have addressed climate change will tell us that we are potentially judged not only by our actions, but by our inactions. And so you not only have, I suggest, a moral duty to act, to, to uh, not cause harm, but to also actively uh, lead us out of the way of harm. Thank I'm you. done, thank you. Hi, Brian Peoples, Trail Now. Um, I rode, I live in Aptos, and I actually did ride my skateboard, not the whole way. I am 54, the new 20, right? <laughs> right, guy, the new 20? Um, anyways, I want to remind us that, you know, a lot of people talk about the need to provide public transit and solutions. You know, this is a solution, and what this does is it enables our community to not have to use those infrastructure resources that other people need, that other people require, because they're older than, not older, just not able to do the skateboard. But technology is advancing, and the skateboard is advancing, and it's a great opportunity for our community to benefit from. I just want to highlight that it would have been really nice to have ridden my skateboard from Aptos, and I'm hoping one day I will be able to ride my skateboard from Aptos to this meeting. Thank you. Karina McFarlane, Live Oak. Um, I want to, the leftover holocaust, he caught me, because the Center for Wise Democracy, who brings the Wisdom Council process to, has bought it all over the world, brought it to Austria by invitation, and they did a Wisdom Council process there, and teenagers came out in tears saying the elders have never been able to talk to us about what happened with that concentration camp and those Nazis there. So that's the Wisdom Council process. So I had, this is an update, because I had um, written to RTC and other places in the county to say, couldn't we sponsor a community conversation, dynamic facilitation by the Center for Wise Democracy and have Jim Ruff come down from Washington State and do that with us? So I was attempting to have that happen in, in conversation with Jim Ruff. And basically what happened, it was um, he said, well, teach a woman to fish. And so we are now training to be dynamic facilitation facilitators for Santa Cruz County. And the upshot is, is that we are going to have a We the People Council process to address the rail corridor issue because I have heard that it's so confounding to people that they've signed both petitions 
for and against, and there are many of the same names. And so I'm really thrilled that this could happen for our county, and it looks like it's coming together and could happen quite quickly, and I'm glad to hear about the January date, but then the March date, and hopefully we can have this Wisdom Council process, Santa Cruz County, We the People Council, facilitated actually by Jim Ruff, who has mastery, and many people in the world have mastery now, but to have Jim Ruff, he's the guy that conceived it. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, how are you doing? Commissioners, uh, Michael Saint with Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Uh, I also had a presentation here which I'm just going to ignore due to the characteristic of the comments. Um, I wanna go back to the last meeting I was unable to attend, but I did watch the video, and uh, I wanted just to make a comment about um, Mike Rotkin's comments, not, not singling him out, because I see similar characteristics throughout the, the council. Uh, primarily, he said he didn't s really like the Ox Lane projects, but being a pragmatic person, he realized that if that wasn't uh, part of the Measure D, we wouldn't be here talking about it and we wouldn't have the funds. Um, but basically, for those of you, everybody I sure understands the, the term pragmatic. I see a lot of that with this council and other people I deal with. It basically, you're practical, matter of fact people, sensible, down to earth, business-like, hard-headed, no nonsense, hard-nosed, is basically Webster's definition. An example of that would be he or she remains pragmatic in most emotional circumstances. We have a very emotional uh, circumstance here, which I don't hear too much from the commissioners here, and that's we have a climate change crisis. No matter what your character is, we need what they would say, all hands on deck, when the ship is sinking, and believe me, the ship is sinking. I also wanted to bring up, I attended Monterey Bay Community Power uh, meeting yesterday, and it is really a breath of fresh air. Uh, Mr. McPherson made a comment, and you can correct me if I get the dates wrong, that we are gonna meet our 2020 goals of greenhouse gas emissions that we were gonna meet in 2035. We'll meet it by 2020. And that's due to Monterey Bay Community Power. But I hate to be the bearer of bad tidings, um, California Transportation Commission studies say if we don't do anything about our transportation problem, all that'll be wiped out by 2035. We'll be back where we were in the beginning. And supporting ox lanes and highway widening is just not cutting it. Uh, also wanted to mention, which I thought was somewhat interesting, I got 40 seconds. Um, about safety, if you're gonna be safe, you're gonna do away with cars. Auto travel kills approximately 32,000 people a year in the USA. Heroin and cocaine overdoses account for approximately 26,000. We say at that point, it's horrible and we wanna start a war on drugs. What do we do about cars when we widen the highway and put people in harm's way? We do nothing, we actually invite people to enjoy that, that type of transportation. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, I'm Brett Garrett. I live in the city of Santa Cruz and I am very proud of my city for approving a climate emergency resolution. Um, and I just wanted to highlight a few portions of that resolution. I obviously don't have time to read all 20 of the whereas clauses, or there's more than 20, uh, but they include various um, concepts including common sense and morality, our local vulnerability to city sea level rise and saltwater intrusion. Um, it mentions transportation is contributing over half of our local city of Santa Cruz carbon emissions. Um, and there could probably be five more whereas clauses just based on things that have happened in the last couple of weeks. Um, fires that have broken out, uh, reports that have become available. Um, and the resolution goes on to say, now be it therefore resolved, the city of Santa Cruz declares that an existential climate emergency threatens our cities, towns, region, state, nation, civilization, humanity, and the natural world. Um, and of course there are a 
lot of further result clauses that I don't have time to read saying what the city is going to do, including policies, transportation demand management, affordable housing, climate action plan, educating residents, community participation, and responsiveness to disadvantaged communities. And I'll, I will read the last three clauses if I can, especially there's one that's very specific to the RTC. Um, be it further resolved, the City of Santa Cruz endorses a just countywide emergency climate action mobilization effort to reverse global warming, <coughs> to reduce drastically citywide greenhouse gas emissions, and safely draw down carbon from the atmosphere as quickly as possible. Be it further resolved, the City of Santa Cruz calls on the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission and other appropriate local agencies to participate in this regional emergency climate action mobilization effort. <coughs> Be it further resolved, the city of Santa Cruz calls for a regional just transition and emergency climate action mobilization collaborative effort, collaborative effort inviting concerned residents, youth, faith, labor, business, environmental, economic, racial, and social justice organizations, as well as other community groups and all elected officials in and from the Santa Cruz and nearby counties, and especially all the mayors who have signed on to enact the Paris, uh, to enact the Paris Agreement. So every decision that we make here needs to be made in the context of a climate emergency. Um, thank you. Thank you. Hello, Carrie, Carrie Pico from Aptos. I do want to take a little, I want to break the rules and I want to pick on Andy Schifrin in the sense of uh, I really enjoy his logic, his thinking, his discussion. It's been very positive. And even if we're on a different viewpoint, I just want to say I really appreciate his presence on the board. So with that said, uh, I've been asked to read the editorial in the Sentinel that managed to appear after about four months in the paper. And hopefully all of you have read it. I am not going to reread it because I don't think I can do it in a short enough time considering that there was an issue that was brought up that I think people need to understand about the um, saving of the rail corridor. Um, about the easements, and I have a saying, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So uh, there's an issue that was discussed in, 20, in, in the agenda about whether or not uh, title to the easements are clear, and if we take the rails out for whatever reason, we may lose whatever easements we have. And the, what I want to point out is, if you don't have title to an easement with or without a rail, if I'm Joe Blow sitting next to the tracks and I own that, and I realize that there's no easement on my property, I could probably go to court right now and go demand compensation for the taking of my land for keeping those tracks in place, okay? Because you don't have legal title. So my point is, don't raise it as an issue of trail versus non-trail or whatever. It's an issue, and you need to take it seriously. Number two is, with or without a trail, when you add a trail to that corridor, that breaks whatever rail easements exist, if they're in writing. Most of them have reverted. By the way, most of the easements have reverted to fee ownership already because of the California Marketability Records Act. So, but the few that exist, or the hundred and some, I don't know what exists, um, when you put in something that's not critical to rail operation, such as, believe it or not, even electrical line is considered critical to rail operation, but a trail is not, that breaks the easement and you run the risk of getting sued on that, regardless of if it's trail only or if it's rail with trail. Why it hasn't happened already, the low hanging fruit has, has already got it started and you'll expect to see it somewhere in the future. <coughs> Lastly, <sighs> This is, the fear of rail banking really, really boggles my mind because by going through rail banking, if we oh, do I not put I in pass- I stop you there. Oh, oh is that uh, part Carrie, of the UCIS? I'll, uh, UCIS, I'm Okay, okay, all I'm saying is, yeah. So the point of the easement is how do you protect the easement? And that's really what I'm talking about. It's not about the, the corridor study, it's about what is the safest risk averse way to go about it. So I, I still don't consider that part of the investment study, but thank you. Thank you. Hello again. Last month's fires were a wake up call. 
we are experiencing the end of the world as we know it. And I don't feel fine. I, for one, am scared as hell. But as a mother, I have to hold on to hope. Bernie Sanders' town hall on Monday night um, offered, a, a, on climate change, offered some sense of hope. If you missed it, it's on YouTube, please watch it. After stating that countries throughout the world must stand up to the fossil fuel industry and transform our energy system away from fossil fuels, Bernie pointed out that his program, unlike commercial television, was not being sponsored by ExxonMobil or the Koch brothers. We sit here in Santa Cruz and it's easy to forget about what's happening in the rest of our state. It's easy to feel proud of the sustainable choices that our county and our state have made. And it's easy to forget that there are other counties in the state that are basically becoming the third world because of the oil that's being produced there and the smog that's filling their air and other things that are happening. The fossil fuel industry doesn't want the public to know that renewable energy can be cheaper and that fossil fuel jobs can, can, can be replaced with healthier, better paying renewable jobs. It's even teaching tomorrow's youth. The NEED project is a 501c3 funded by the fossil fuel industry that creates K through 12 curriculums and sponsors solar projects in schools. I have some pro-fossil fuel coloring sheets that I'll pass around to all of you today um, that are part of their energy curriculum. The California State Program Director for the NEED Project serves on the board of our local Friends of the Rail and Trail. In fact, he's in the room today. A little food for thought. Think about what is influencing our conversation that may be beyond our radar screens. 90% of the world's scientists agree that we need profound changes in the next 10 to 12 years to build a more equitable world and sustain life as we know it. We must all question the systemic problems that are dooming our children and heal the divides that stand between a scary today and a nightmarish tomorrow to give our children a chance to build a better world. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's Green New Deal offers hope. Other change-oriented young people taking office around our country, including Drew Glover, Justin Cummings, and Paco Estrada that have been elected locally, offer hope. The tide of change will help to bring integrity and courage to all levels of our government, and those who have become too comfortable will begin to realize that there's more than one way to win an election, and we simply cannot allow money, industry, and ego-driven power to continue to steer our future. We need serious changes, and your agency can make those changes. They can Thank be profound and positive. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll hand these around. Good morning. Morning, Ryan Sarnataro. I have a, an accounting request. And because uh, standard accounting doesn't necessarily answer the questions that people have. And so in, in the in the case of the, of, uh, the corridor or in the case of uh, how, how the commission or how, the, how our county is spending money in, in the rail area, it would be really nice if we had a financial statement that gave us what monies were being spent in support of which aspects of the, of the project. So uh, I would personally like to know where the money comes from in terms of whether it's Proposition D money, whether it's discretionary money, whether it's grant money, to, uh, to be maintaining and fixing the rails uh, so that we, were, we would be able to contrast that with what the costs would be if the decision had been made in the past or gets made in the future about taking the rails out. And uh, when I look at the statements, I, I can't get that answer because it's trying to slice and, slice and, tr uh, slice and dice things differently than, um, than standard accounting does. So uh, if you can think in terms of the questions the public might have about what's going on and come up with uh, supplementary reports that, that you know, easily give us that information and also give it over a long period of time, uh, not just you know, 2016, 2017, but if you could give it all the way back to when we, when we first got the corridor, it'd give, a, give an idea because, you know, one person here said, well, it's $15 million in the next 
10 years, and I've heard figures like we've already spent $6 million because we left the rails in instead, of instead of deciding to take them out. And those are questions I'd love to, love to see an answer to. Thanks. Thank you. Seeing no one else, we'll move on with our uh, regular agenda. Uh, Mr. Dondero, is there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, we have um, a replacement page for item five, replacement pages for item 10, a handout for item 23, another handout for item 23, and replacement pages for item 24. Okay, thank you. Then we'll move on to the consent agenda. Uh, uh, there are a number of items on here which are considered non-controversial. We'll, we'll see if there's any member of the of the commission who wants to ask or pull any of the items. M Ms. Brown. I'd, I'd just like to move the consent. Well, let me, let me just see if anybody uh, here has any questions. Uh, Mr. Mulhern. Uh, just very briefly, I wanted to thank staff very much for um, the storm damage updates. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting more information. Sarah is doing a great job. and. I'm looking forward to her reports in the future. Um, in particular, I want to call out that uh, the 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 rail the rail trestle fence at the Rio Del Mar crossing um, is going to be fixed in the short term here. So we've been waiting 18 months for that. Um, very excited. I'm looking forward to not getting any more phone calls about it. So thank <laughs> you. <laughs> All right. Any other comments? Yes, uh, Mr. Schifrin. If it's okay with the commission, I, I don't want to pull this, but I'd like to add a direction to item number six, which is the update on the Highway 1, uh, Tier 1 and 2 uh, final EIR. And that was that we would get a report at our next meeting on the timeline and process for moving forward uh, after the release of the final EIR. Uh, what would, what will, for instance, what will be Caltrans' role in approving the, uh, certifying the EIR and approving the project? What will be the Commission's role? What uh, is the anticipated time when we'll see the final design? Just so um, it, the staff report is, is helpful as far as it goes, but it doesn't really look into the future of how quickly the Commission's going to be able to, or Caltrans is going to be able to move the, tier two projects forward. So if it's okay with the commission, I would just ask for a report at our next meeting with the timeline of future actions on that final EIR. Great. All right, so there's been additional direction added to uh, uh, number six. Uh, is there any member of the public who wants to comment on items on the consent agenda? Seeing I move the consent agenda as amended. Mm -hmm. Motion by uh, Schifrin, seconded by Bertrand. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Now we move on to our regular agenda, which is uh, commissioner's reports. Are there any commissioners who would like to report on transportation related items um, uh, uh, right now? Seeing none, uh, move on to the director's report. Well, this is a uh, uh, unusual day uh, here in that we have two executive directors, dueling executive directors. So Mr. Dondero, uh, uh, the senior executive director, uh, we'll let you speak first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, you get a twofer today. You're gonna get two reports. Um, so uh, it's been uh, a little over 12 and a half years since I arrived here, and it's been quite a ride. Um, there's been many high points and just a few not so high ones along the way. Um, but uh, as Mr. Leopold told me during the Measure D campaign, enjoy the high points. You will forget the dark moments after the election is over. And I think you were mostly right about that. Uh, many of you shared in creating those key moments that have enriched our community and our lives. What fun it has been. Transportation seems to attract passionate citizen engagement at a very intense level. I think we already experienced that today. Um, we are fortunate to live in a society that encourages open discourse in government, and your decisions are enriched because of it. And along the way, we have all learned the true importance of never losing your sense of humor. But the great thing about this job is the chance to work with so many truly dedicated, highly educated, visionary, articulate, and very smart people. How could one ask for more? The caliber of RTC staff sets a very high bar. You are fortunate to have them. 
There has never been a day when I came to work wanting to be somewhere else. It has been a privilege and an honor to work with so many fine people, including you, our commissioners, our many partners, both in government and the nonprofit world, our staff, and our citizens. Getting Measure D passed accomplished a goal that I had long held, and that was to work in a self-help county. Passing the measure was the work of many dedicated, hardworking people, too numerous to name here. A few deserve special mention, however. Casey Beyer, Bill Teisling, Corinna Pushnik, Don Lane, Bruce McPherson, and of course, Mr. Leopold all played essential roles in getting 67% of the voters to support the measure. It was a goal that many said could not be accomplished. Well, they were wrong. You face a similar challenge now to move forward on making best use of the rail corridor. I encourage you to take the next logical steps towards implementing high quality public transit in the county. Your new executive director is well equipped to help you, help you take such action. Thank you again for your support and providing many opportunities to better our communities over the past dozen years. And with that, I'll hand it off to Mr. Preston. Good so, morning. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, thank you, George, for um, for the service that you provided to, to Santa Cruz County and the RTC. Um, you have been an inspiration to me. Um, now you get the rookie report. <laughs> um, today, today is my fourth day on the job, so I'll try to keep it a little bit short. Um, I, I wanted to, to thank staff for all that they've done to welcome me, as well as the commissioners. It's, uh, you know, it, there was no question that I was showing up to work today. Um, so I'm here, I'm, I'm ready to go, and I've already started, and, and I'm well entrenched in, in the details and the issues that are going on. Um, on my first day, I was fortunate to attend the pre-construction meeting for the San Lorenzo River uh, Bridge Trestle Project. Um, that's a, a, a project to, to widen what right, right now is just a pedestrian walkway to one that would also allow bicycles to ride across it. Um, you will no longer have to walk your bike across and lift it up so you can get by the bike going in the other direction. Um, it was uh, very exciting to hear that the contractor plans to mobilize on January 2nd um, and that uh, Cushman Construction is committed to getting the walkway <coughs> open before the tourist season. Um, it was also um, very interesting to see the public-private partnership in place because the Seaside Company is providing resources to make sure that that project is successful. Um, I would also like to report about um, my Monday meeting with Alex Clifford at uh, uh, Santa Cruz Metro. Um, he was also very welcoming and um, gave me a, a tour of his office and uh, his management staff. We had a very positive conversation on the importance of providing <coughs> reliable funding to, to Santa Cruz Metro. Um, I've had several briefings from staff that were very educational on the um, Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail, um, Highway 1, and the railway. Um, I have been reading a lot. There are a lot of reports out there. I've read the UCS. I've read the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail um, uh, uh, documents. And I've also learned and read a lot on bus on shoulders, which I did not know a lot about and was very important in tying things together. Um, the last thing I would like to report on is that the uh, Santa Cruz uh, City Planning Commission has postponed consideration of the CEQA document for the phase two of the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Segment 7 project due to potential impacts to the monarch butterfly. And according to the city, they will evaluate options including potentially refining the project and or developing potential mitigation measures. And that's all I have on my report. Well, welcome uh, to the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. We're very excited about you uh, joining uh, our uh, team 
and I'm looking forward to the leadership that you can provide uh, uh, to our commission and to the community. And I thank uh, Mr. Dondero for his incredible service. We'll get to that in just a moment, but, uh, but uh, uh, we're very fortunate right now to have you both there. And, and one more thing, uh, Chair Leopold, um, there will be a groundbreaking ceremony for the, uh, the, the project to, to convert the, the pedestrian walkway to a uh, multi-use facility, and uh, that is going to be on January 10th. January 10th, all right. We'll look forward to receiving more information about it. Um, next, I'm gonna move on to the Caltrans report. Uh, I see we have a new person in the Caltrans seat, welcome. Right, good morning, uh, commissioners. My name is John Olenek from Caltrans District 5. Here on behalf of uh, Tim Gubbins, our district director, who is attending CTC this week. Also on behalf of Eileen Lowe, our deputy of planning, who is also uh, called to duty, that being jury duty. So <laughs> <laughs> she was the last uh, seat of the alternative group, so she was almost excused and was able to be here today, but I'm, I'm here on her behalf. Uh, so I'll keep my comments brief. Uh, as uh, SB1, of course, uh, has stayed, so does the business of transportation in California. And so there's a lot of work to do. Uh, in California, we've completed already this year 50 projects under the SB1 uh, funding. We have to, about 50 more that are gonna be done before the end of the year, so in that short amount of time. Um, but it's not just construction, it's also planning that's very important. Uh, and the SB1 funding provides uh, a, a good amount of money for continued planning and allow, allows for many planning grant opportunities for jurisdictions. In District 5, we've been very successful with our planning grants. We've been able to secure quite a few of them and quite a few uh, within Santa Cruz County as well. In fact, right now in our district, we're uh, screening 13 new applications for grants that we just received and hope to uh, uh, you know, be able to see those be successful in our area as well. But all that to say that uh, it's our intent and goal to continue to promote that with our jurisdictions. And a part of our, my personal hope next year is to be able to reach out to areas that haven't been traditionally applying for these planning grants, maybe for whatever reasons. Maybe we can help them, encourage them. So we've held workshops, we've done a few other things, but just so you know, it's our intent to continue to support the communities to apply for those things because if a, if a, a project or a study is not completed, if it's not planned, it's not gonna get funded. And so uh, as a planning board, and having an ex excellent planning staff that work for you. Uh, we look forward to working together uh, with you on that. So with that, I'll conclude my comments. Uh, thank you, and I, I note that uh, Santa Cruz County voters had the w uh, wisdom to reject pr Proposition 6 by 75%. I mean, 75% voted against uh, Prop 6, so we're very proud of that and the, w and the messaging that went out from all the transportation agencies and public works agencies. Are there questions for Caltrans? Uh, Mr. Caput. But uh, thank you for being here. And, uh, with the, uh, on 18-7, uh, it has Highway 152, Americans with Disabilities Act, the sidewalk uh, from Wagner Street all the way down to Houlihan. So it says winter of 2018. Uh, is that going to start pretty soon, or uh, does that start rain or shine? Uh. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I was told on my way to the meeting here that um, this this update might have had a few more uh, revisions to it even before it was presented, so I can take that back as an inquiry through staff, if that's how you'd like to, to provide an update uh, on that project, if that's the board's wish and the staff's wish. That'll be fine. And then uh, one thing that I couldn't find on there, or was on there before, uh, on Highway 152 at East Beach uh, and Marchant Street, uh, it's supposed to be on the work order for a uh, safe route to school part uh, where they're putting in a new um, crosswalk light right there by the high school. Um, I, I don't know why it hasn't, it's not on the uh, list. I saw it before, uh, if you could find that out. I'll, I'll take that note. So you said that was Highway 152 in Marshall. Yeah, Street. it's uh, Highway 152 is normally um, East Lake Avenue, but it has to, because it's one way in that section, it's actually, uh, I guess you would call it an extension. It goes on East Beach, heading east. And um, it's at Marchant Street and East Beach. 200 block of East Beach Street, right at Watsonville High School. It's supposed to be a, a state-of-the-art, I guess, uh, crosswalk for 
the 2,000 plus students that uh, use it in the morning and also at lunchtime and in the afternoon. Okay, thank you. Mr. Schifrin. I'm going to also ask you a couple of very brief questions. I don't expect you to have the answer uh, to today, but would appreciate your getting the, uh, the responses back to me. One of them is on page 18-5, project number 10, which is the Highway 1 Davenport culvert replacement. Um, I've heard that there may be a study that Caltrans is undertaking uh, regarding the red-legged frogs and the impact of culverts on red-legged frogs. I appreciate finding out if that's the case <coughs> and if it is what the status of that study is. It could affect other projects um, if that study is being done, other cover projects. The second uh, issue has to do with the Scott Creek Bridge uh, replacement project that's been going on for an interminable amount of time. Uh, and um, I was told that the future of uh, Caltrans ability to perhaps move forward with that project uh, had to do with the fate of uh, Proposition uh, 6 and with the failure of that um, that proposition and the, uh, the continuation of SB1 funding. I'd like to find out what the status is of Caltrans uh, uh, commitment to moving forward with that project. Thank you. I'll definitely take those back as uh, responses to needy. Appreciate it. Mr. Bertrand. I have two questions. Uh, we did talk about this beforehand, but I just want to say it for the public. So. Um, in Caltrans review, you had specific comments, and I'm not sure if you were part of that review, and if you had time to review them, um, but it seemed like you have. So one is the potential benefits of the HOV system and how that's considered an ultimate long-term sustainable solution for addressing congestion and delay on Highway 1. So our scenario B doesn't have that. Has that been added? I don't think it's been added, HOV for scenario B. I'll let staff answer. Yes. The question was again, um, please. I just want to make sure, has HOV been added to uh, several communities, uh, Watsonville in particular, have added various scenario uh, additions, and has HOV been added to scenario B? Uh, if, if you recall, the, the recommendation that was um, presented to the commission in, in, in November, um, it does include HOV lanes in a you know sort of longer term beyond 2035, uh, possibility um, because the unified quarter study is looking at uh, you know 2035. Uh, I seem uh, to recall that time yes. frame, uh, and within that time frame, we don't see that that it's possible to uh, fund an HOV project but beyond 2035, perhaps. Okay, so we're committed to doing HOV beyond the time frame of this study, starting in 19 uh, 2035. Well, the Unified Corridor Study Recommendation is a recommendation for, for the Commission, and it's up to the Commission to then determine what the Commission wants to commit to. Okay, thank you very much. Then I have one other question. Um, so <coughs> in regards to Section 5B, uh, there were some issues with the rail corridor service, and this has to do with funding in reference to Proposition 116. So Proposition 116 funds are restricted supporting uh, passenger okay. rail service. Are we, are we on the Caltrans report? Yes, I am. Okay. okay. Uh, 23, page 23.7. Okay, thank you. Uh, for the, the board, 23.7, item 5B. So um, the funds are restricted to supporting rap, uh, passenger rail service and the other fund sources cited, such as central, federal lands, STP and PTA, are each subject to different sets of guidelines and may be managed differently to, apport, um, to, to avoid losses and repayment. So can you explain a little bit more what that actually means? This is page 23.7. It's at the bottom of the page. So I, I think questions have come up in regards to uh, CTC and Proposition 116, how we receive well, fundings to get a yeah, corridor. I, you know. uh, uh, Mr. Bertrand, uh, uh, 237 is the unified corridor. Uh, Am I study. on the wrong? Okay. Um, so I, I was I was trying to. Uh, uh, we will get to you. I, I promise. Uh, I just want to see if there's any other questions about uh, the Caltrans report. Well, it seems to be 23. 23 uh, right, denotes that it's item 23, um, and that is the unified corridor investment study. Additional information it is? item. Yeah. So. 
it's it's this um, we're on item 18 on right now which yeah not 23. I don't, um, uh, Mr. Dondero. Uh, yes, I, I'd like to respond to Mr. Schifrin's question about the Scott Creek project because okay. there, there the is- The Terminable, I think it was called. Uh, yeah, Scott yeah. Creek well project. actually, yeah. <laughs> I'd, li I'd like to make a slight correction. You might want to change your um, descriptor there. Uh, <laughs> we were encouraged- It seems that way. Yeah, uh, <laughs> staff has not forgotten the project. Actually, it's, it's, it's a, 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 one of my favorite projects. Uh, we are working uh, in conjunction with uh, staff over at the Resource Conservation District to put together a grant application uh, through the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to fund the first document that Caltrans needs to produce called a pro project initiation document. Um, it's sort of a planning level uh, description of the project and gets costs and uh, scope uh, narrowed in. and. Uh, we're actually working on that uh, as we speak to, to get resources marshaled for that. Uh, that grant application is due the 18th of this month, so we have to scramble, but we're, we're working towards that. So that, that actually would be a, a significant step uh, towards moving the project along. Thank you. You're welcome. All righty, any other uh, comments about the Caltrans report? Is there any public testimony about Caltrans? Good morning. I actually have a question. Um, welcome. The, I know that Caltrans is currently conducting a climate change vulnerability assessment summary report, and the first segment of that was recently published um, on District 4. And I'm wondering if you know by any chance what the timing looks like for our district's assessment and how this agency, um, in their efforts to make fiscally wise and sustainable and adaptable choices for our future, um, should be incorporating that type of thinking into their their thought process. Thank you. Is there anyone else who uh, would like to uh, provide testimony about the Caltrans report? Uh, seeing none, uh, uh, let's see if uh, Mr. Olink. Olenek. Olenek. Did I get it right? Olenek. Olenek. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Uh, just, just briefly, it is true that if of the 12 districts of Caltrans, we uh, are on the list to eventually have District 5 have a climate uh, vulnerability assessment report. I don't know when that is to be. Um, their work, you know, 12 districts to go through along the state of California, so I don't have the exact answer of when. However, uh, uh, AMBAG, our, our MPO, Association of Monterey Barrier Governments, uh, we have uh, given them a s climate sustainability grant. They're initiating a study to look at uh, sustainability as it relates to transportation along the Highway 1 Moss Landing area, an area that's important to both Monterey County and Santa Cruz County. So I, I'd encourage everyone to keep uh, their eyes and ears open uh, to that because there will, will be public outreach as that uh, progresses as well. So that's somewhat, it is kind of, a, it is a climate vulnerability assessment type of report as it relates to transportation in that focused area. And then hopefully in the future, we'll come around to be on the list for District 5 for our full uh, five counties for the report. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll move on to item number 19, which is an appreciation of Executive Director George Dondero and Fiscal Officer Daniel Nakuna. Um, uh, Daniel is here. Uh, Mr. Dondero, do you want to say something uh, uh, about Mr. Nakuna? <laughs> um, Please come forward. Daniel. Daniel is, is, is someone we usually see, we don't usually see. <laughs> Um, Daniel preceded me uh, by many years on this commission, um, and uh, he's been one of the reasons that I can sleep at night because he keeps our books um, absolutely um, squeaky clean. We get good um, audits every year um, because of Daniel's integrity and his um, uh, focus and uh, determination to make sure we comply with all state and federal, federal regulations. Um, it's been a real pleasure to work with Daniel, um, and uh, just by coincidence, he and I ended up uh, deciding to exit about the same time. So. Well, uh, let me just say that uh, I know Daniel well as, uh, as uh, my wife was a former employee many years ago when the RTC was, a, was an arm of the county uh, in this building on the fourth floor. And uh, the commission, way before I got here, made a decision to separate from the county and be a standalone uh, organization. Um, and when you're in charge of the, f uh, the fiscal matters, uh, a separation is way bigger than just a, 
uh, moved to a different office. And uh, in all the years that uh, Daniel has been responsible for the fiscal matters, uh, we, um, we've thrown a lot of curves at him. Um, uh, but as Mr. Dondero pointed out, we've always come through uh, with shining colors uh, when it comes to audits, and there's never been a question uh, of how we spend the money. Uh, we might disagree of whether we're spending it appropriately, but once we take the action, Daniel makes sure that we uh, get it in the right place. Uh, he's a quiet presence, but a very important presence and a, and, and, and a good a coworker. So uh, Daniel, you, you will be missed as a member of the Regional Transportation Commission staff. And I just wanna appreciate your many years of service, 26 years of service. And I have a, a, resol a, 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 a framed appreciation for you. Daniel, you're a back office person, but this is your chance to tell us what you really think. <laughs> Thank you, all member of the commission. Uh, commissioner Leopold was uh, correct. I was interviewed in this, this building here on the second floor. Um, I was delighted, but I had my doubt whether or not I would survive. Here I am 26 years later. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I really appreciate uh, uh, the opportunity to serve uh, uh, the community. Um, also, I would like to thank uh, the staff, uh, my colleagues, and also uh, the management. Um, I got really great support uh, from uh, the management, uh, past and present. Um, also, I did have really good uh, working relationship with uh, uh, staff from uh, other sister agencies, um, the metro, uh, the cities, Caltrans. So I'm uh, glad I was hired <laughs> to work here in Santa Cruz. It's a great place to work for. Thank you, Santa Cruz. Having been on the uh, commission as an alternate probably since even, well, no, I know for sure since before Daniel uh, was hired, and, uh, it's, and having read commission agendas for many years and also <coughs> been on the Budget and Administration Committee, I don't think it's appreciated just how complicated funding of transportation is in the state of California. There's federal requirements, there's state requirements, we have our own requirements, we have to deal with AMBAG. Um, it's enormously compli complicated and there's always somebody who's looking over your shoulder. It may be the county, it may be the federal government, but it's, I really think it's a, uh, it's a great achievement on Daniel's part to have been able to get through all those years and all those documents and all those audits as <laughs> well as he has. And uh, he's come to meetings to try to explain some of the uh, intricacies of the financing about why we pay overhead two years in the past. I remember those meetings as being fascinating, trying to understand <laughs> what it all means. Daniel has done, a, you've done a yeoman's job over the years and I think, uh, I know I personally really appreciate the work you've done and the um, commitment to the commission and the achievements that you have uh, uh, helped to bring to the, uh, to the commission. So thank you. So um, I learned to appreciate uh, what you've done for Santa Cruz and RTC by the fact that you've avoided the necessity to go over a little bit of miscalculation on an audit. 
something that happened a long time ago and you were able to avoid. I've been on agencies where sometimes discrepancies are in the pennies and it takes a considerable long time and a lot of staff time that could be devoted to something else. So it's amazing that you've been able to achieve that for this agency here. Um, also, I had the pleasure, I think, of spending some time with you for about two hours, and I was very impressed with you, your personality, you're a very interesting person, and I have a feeling that um, you're gonna enjoy everything after the RTC and have a very full life. Thank you very much. Any other comments? Okay, uh, Chair Leopold, now we'll uh, get to the other uh, person of this monumental day, I believe, here at the RTC, George Dondero, uh, is gonna be leaving us, and uh, John, I'll let you say a few words. Sure. Um, uh, George uh, Dondero has been with uh, the Regional Transportation Commission since April 2006. Um, he came after a, a pretty devastating failure by this commission um, and uh, with a, a, a sales tax measure in 2004. Um, and so it wasn't a great time to join uh, the R RTC. And on top of that, the, the commission then had a transportation funding task force, uh, which was uh, complicated, large, uh, uh, and had a lot of meetings, uh, uh, but in the end didn't g deliver us uh, to a place of consensus about what to do about transportation. It's very hard to do here in Santa Cruz County. George has been uh, relentless in trying to promote a vision of uh, transportation that meets a lot of different needs. And sometimes uh, he's, he's been at the front of the line, sometimes we've had to, we've, we've had to drag him along. Uh, I, I can tell you that when I became supervisor, um, I thought we should buy the rail line. And I had a meeting with uh, George and some other commissioners. And I said, why, ha why haven't we done that? And he said, well, I don't think people are that into it. And I said, well, you should get out more often. And uh, uh, you know, what, what we see by the passion of our current discussion about the uh, a train or trail is that people want that resource and we have strong opinions about what we should do with it, but the fact that uh, we were able to acquire that key piece of property allows us uh, to think about our, uh, our transportation future on that corridor. Likewise, the very hard work that you did in, uh, you have done in terms of building relationships and articulating a vision of multimodal transportation in Santa Cruz County allowed us uh, to, to work with such a large part of the community to craft a self-help measure um, that became Measure D and enjoy broad support. And uh, when we think about where you started and the, 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 this d dismal failure of the previous sales tax measure to getting over two thirds um, in 2016, that alone would, would uh, be an incredible accomplishment. But you also have done it by um, supporting your staff, and we have a lot of longtime staff members who've been here, who have, uh, who have been nurtured and mentored uh, by you. You have helped uh, have this uh, commission address issues of sustainability and uh, as a priority in our regional transportation planning documents, which we never had before. Um, and you have arranged for us individually and collectively to be able to speak to other uh, transportation officials at the state level um, uh, to be able to advocate for the transportation needs. Uh, I wanna express my appreciation as the chair of the commission, as a supervisor on the board of supervisor, and as a member of the Santa Cruz County community for the hard work that you've put in over the last 12 and a half years. And I wish you great uh, success and happiness um, uh, in your years of retirement. Thank you for your contribution to Santa Cruz. I do also have an appreciation here. I think we'll probably hear from other commissioners, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll, uh, I'll let you have the, uh, the resolution first.
All right, before you get a chance to speak, I'll, I'll see if other members of the commission want to add any remarks. Uh, you want to start with Mr. Schifrin? Okay, um, I also want to thank you, George, for your long service. And I, wa I will echo everything that the uh, uh, chair has said. But I would also add something else, because there has been criticism that the staff operates independently and just does whatever it wants to do. And I think that it's a, it's a tricky line to, uh, to walk between providing leadership and yet representing the commission. And from my perspective, the only thing I would really add to what the chair has said is that you have represented the commission and you followed through and carried out the directions that the commission um, gave you. And not every, you know, that doesn't always occur with staff. Uh, oftentimes they have minds of their own and they go in directions of their own. Um, but particularly in a very um, contentious environment, as sometimes it is in Santa Cruz County, um, where uh, staff often, often becomes the whipping boy for uh, the, the public, um, in a sense that is great from a commission point of view because your staff serves as a buffer so that we don't get as criticized, uh, we wish. Um, but really, I think, I, I feel, I really want to commend you for um, maybe learning uh, what Santa Cruz was like from where you came um, and then learning and changing as you saw where the commission was moving to uh, and I think you helped make the commission more effective in the way and the direction it was moving, uh, which is, I think, Measure D is the example of that. Um, and you maybe took your values, but rec recognized that really your job was to carry out the directions of the commission and carry out the policies that the commission has adopted. And as the commission has changed over the years, I think you've been very effective in helping uh, helping the commission carry out its policies. But I think it's important to uh, thank you for that as well. Besides your leadership, you've also been a good, um, a, 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 a good follower in a way of the commission's, uh, the commission's directions, and I really appreciate that. Commissioner Brown. I would just ditto everything that's been said uh, and just want to add, uh, you know, I, one of the things that I really appreciate in addition to all of that is that you've done all of this with a uh, sense of calm and clarity and good humor. Um, so, so thank you. You really will be missed and enjoy your retirement. Yeah, yeah, I, um, I think any of the elected officials here or staff members, alternates, uh, would agree that probably transportation is a subject that we get more inquiries about or criticism of or whatever you might say than any other subject that we, we face uh, day in, day, year in, year out. And we bring a lot of those uh, complaints or concerns and kudos at times uh, to you and your staff. and. Uh, the, the, I think the, the length of the staff members that have been with you is a testament to your leadership and your ability to work with different interests and different subject matters. Uh, in particular, I want to say thank you for your efforts on Measure D, uh, multimodal, uh, modal transportation network proposal that if any one of those facets would not have been included in that measure, and people can say it wouldn't have passed without us or me or th that subject, they're right. It wouldn't have passed without any of them. But you found a way uh, to help us uh, really develop a measure that more than two-thirds of the voters said yes to, because this is a complex and really an integrated uh, transportation network that we have to work with and really uh, make work for the people of Santa Cruz County. And you've put us in a place that we can work as best we can and make the decisions that are about to come upon us uh, to the best of our abilities because of your leadership. I wanna thank you very much for your professionalism and uh, your concern um, and your appreciation of Santa Cruz County transportation. Thank you very much. Uh, I haven't known George as long as many people on this board, but uh, George and I developed an intense relationship because uh, 
I relocated in Capitola last February and I woke up in the morning and saw this man dumping trash in front of my house and realized that George was my neighbor. And uh, um, since then, we shared a lot of conversation about you know transportation, back in his job previous to this and all the things he's accomplished, pretty remarkable, and some of his hobbies, which he has, which is photography, which I'm glad he shared that with me also because uh, just a wealth of knowledge. Uh, I was also fortunate to take a trip with George last February to freezing cold Minnesota, which both of us want to forget. <laughs> but uh, I, it just tells something about George. You know, whatever the job needed to be done, George was willing to go do it. Um, he's done a remarkable thing for this county. Everybody's mentioned all of his other accomplishments, but it's just been a pleasure getting to know George closely the past year, and I appreciate his intensity, and uh, he's going to be missed. Ms. Chase. George, I just want to say that I very much appreciate your ability to inspire enthusiasm and excitement about transportation. Before I was elected, I used a lot of different modes of transportation, but I didn't think about them with the level of inquiry and inquisitiveness and, and um, that I think that you help us do as commissioners and as members of the public. We got to go on several community leadership visits together. and because of our conversations during those visits. Everywhere I go now, I think about the different modes of transit, transportation that are used in those communities and how they do it well and how they could do it better and how we compare. And I think that that's something that lasts for a very long time with people. And I uh, just want to thank you for that, for helping change the way that I think about transportation and then through that, that I'm helping others do that too. Everyone said so much, <laughs> I have to admit. So um, I've been on this for a very short period of time, and I'm sort of wondering why you didn't retire earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what a difficult job. <laughs> I mean, truly. So um, Obama got a lot of gray hair on his job, and <laughs> maybe, you know, yeah, you got a few too. Sure. Um, but I'd like to add something no one else has touched. Um, many of the things that people have said I could say too. Um, I'm really happy that when I reached out to you to ask questions, uh, you set aside time to, to meet with me, and I value that a lot. Um, I, I see that in the new executive director is coming up. He's already reached out to me without me even saying anything. So, but you know, you were very able to do that, and um, to the public, I have to say, it was hard to find a day and a time to meet with you because you're so busy. But you made the effort, so uh, sometimes I had to wait a week or so, but you made that effort, and I truly appreciate that. Thank you. All right, George, it's, uh, it's your last meeting. Uh, you can tell us how you really feel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Did you get the paycheck yet? Uh, okay. Haven't got the last paycheck oh. yet. Not yet, no. Actually, my last official day is the 21st. Uh, but. Uh, you know, people ask me, well, what are you going to do with all that free time? And I tell them all, always the same thing, and that's do all the things I don't have time to do now that I love to do. Uh, Ed mentioned photography, and um, while I've been in Santa Cruz, I've really discovered wildlife, in particular bird photography, and uh, there's been so many opportunities here. It's been great, and I want to pursue that uh, a, a great deal more. Um, I have other interests in um, jazz music. I like to cook. I like to get together with folks. Um, I like the Sierras. I like to hike. I mean, there's a lot of, just so many things to do. And then one, one thing I've always, has been in my bucket list, and that's to learn how to fly fish. So um, who knows? Maybe we'll, we'll get to that, too. Um, it's been a real privilege to, to serve this community. Um, it's uh, certainly never been boring. Um, I remember when I first accepted the job and uh, sent a note out to my colleagues around the state, I got some interesting responses back. Um, <laughs> my friend Phil Dow, who was uh, the executive director up in Mendocino County, which he th compared uh, to be a, a very close parallel to Santa Cruz County politically, um, his only comment was, are you nuts? <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
spelled N-U-T-Z. <laughs> um, but I, I knew I had made a good choice. I knew there was going to be lots of opportunities to, um, to help the community, and certainly we've, we've tried to, to move things forward, and I know that your new director will keep that momentum going, and I wish you all well in the years ahead. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to uh, move to the, the next item, which uh, I'm actually going to postpone, which is item 20, which is appreciation of departing commissioner. Cynthia Chase uh, may not be leaving us just yet. Uh, she, uh, th there's, uh, because of the vagaries of the, uh, of the transit board uh, process, the city of Santa Cruz is likely going to be voting on keeping her on the Metro Board until the, the City uh, Council uh, makes the uh, appointments to the various uh, agencies with their, new, um, with their new council. And so we're not gonna say goodbye to Cynthia just yet. She'll probably be with us at least one, maybe two more meetings. Uh, so we're gonna, uh, we're gonna table this until that day actually comes. So um, Next, we'll move on to item uh, 21, which is the election of the 2018 RTC chair and vice chair. As uh, is our usual case, um, we try to have both a city member and um, uh, a, a city uh, council member and a member of the board of supervisors as the chair and vice chair. Currently, I serve as the chair, and Mr. Bottorf uh, serves as the vice chair. Um, uh, our uh, nomination uh, group uh, looked at uh, uh, supervisors and we realized that uh, Supervisor Bruce McPherson has not had the opportunity to be uh, the chair. Uh, so uh, so uh, I'm nominating... You're clapping, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nominating uh, 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 Ed Bottorf as chair and Bruce McPherson as vice chair for 2018. I move that Not nominations be closed. Uh, oh, motion by Schifrin, seconded by Bertrand. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, then uh, I'll nominate uh, the two, uh, uh, Ed Bottorf and Bruce McPherson as chair and vice chair. Now we just vote on that nomination. The yeah. nominations are closed. My parliamentarian says we can just <laughs> vote on it. So all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, motion carries unanimously. Uh, uh, we'll look forward to your leadership in 2019. So thank you. Uh, next we'll move on to item number 23, which is our Unified Corridor Investment Study. Uh, uh, good morning, Ms. Dykar. I think it's still morning. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. Yes, I'm Ginger Dykar, Senior Transportation Planner here at the RTC and Project Manager for the Unified Corridor Study. At the November 15th, um, 2018 RTC meeting, staff was requested to bring back information, responses to a number of questions that the, from the commission, and the UCS staff report today does provide those responses. Also as part of the staff report, there is a comment letter from Caltrans on the Unified Corridor Investment Study. I would like to like, take a little time to clarify some of the uh, issues that were raised. Caltrans commented on the carpool mode share and did not understand why it would decrease with an HOV lane project. It was a simple explanation for that, and I have had a discussion with Caltrans, Kelly McClendon, to um, explain this result. I'll explain it to he you here today. So th for the mode share performance measure, it's a forecast of the mo mode share based on the group of projects that were being evaluated in each scenario. So in each scenario, there's a number of projects in addition to the highway project that include transit and bicycling and pedestrian projects with the intent to reduce the number of autom autos compared to a no-build scenario. So in the scenarios with the HOV lanes, the carpool mode share does decrease relative to the no-build because the total amount of auto trips decreases, but it decreases less in the scenarios with the HOV lanes than scenarios without it. Uh, so it's a different than if you're evaluating just one project as being evaluated in the highway one EIR that just looks at the HOV lanes. You'd see the carpool mode share numbers increase, the um, single occupant vehicle mode shares decrease. But given that in the scenario analysis, we evaluate a number of projects, there's, there's um, 
an overall decrease, but it's uh, re relative to the number of single occupant vehicles, it increases with the projects with HOV lanes, or the scenarios with HOV lanes. Another comment from Caltrans was on the performance measures that were used in the Unified Corridor Study compared to the 2018 Comprehensive Multimodal Corridor Plan Guidelines. These guidelines are just being finalized either yesterday or today for approval from the California Transportation Commission, so it's been a work in progress. The performance measures that are provided in the 2018 Comprehensive Modal Multimodal Corridor Plan Guidelines are examples of performance measures to use. The California Transportation Commission realizes that data availability as well as modeling capabilities vary by agency and that performance measures should be evaluated to the degree, degree reasonable given the available resources of the agency. So there is not necessarily <laughs> one list of performance measures that fits all. <laughs> And um, there are some requirements. There's various different areas that are required in the performance measures. For example, evaluate safety, evaluate congestion, accessibility, greenhouse gas emission reductions. But these are more generic um, groupings. And the performance measures used in the Unified Corridor Study does uh, cover these various categories. Another requirement in these guidelines is that the performance measures used in the corridor plan are to be consistent with the goals and objectives defined in the Regional Transportation Plan for Santa Cruz County. While the performance measures for the Unified Cor Corridor Study were very much teed off of the, the uh, performance measures that were developed in the 2014 Regional Transportation Plan as well as the 2040 Regional Transportation Plan, there was a lot of work done in both of those plans to, to uh, align our performance measures with the acceptable performance measures that are out there in California. Um, and they very much consider the data that is available for Santa Cruz County and provide a mix of measures that are understandable and provide the greatest insight for the Santa Cruz County community. And as well, the stakeholder and public input for the Unified Corridor Study was very much considered in developing the performance measures in this study. And uh, lastly, on that issue, the Unified Corridor Investment Study does meet the requirements as the corridor plan that is needed to apply for funds from the Senate Bill 1 Congested Corridors Program for highway and other, and potentially other improvements. So now I wanna jump back to the questions and responses that were um, requested of the commission. The first question, is the Unified Corridor Study exempted under CEQA or is it required to have an environmental review? So the Unified Corridor Study is exempt from CEQA, as CEQA applies to approval of a project. Acceptance of the UCS report and selection of a preferred scenario does not create any legally binding commitments as future decisions will be required to determine whether to implement a project. So again, acceptance of the UCS report and selection of a preferred scenario does not create a legally binding commitment. The second question was, can progressive rail limit efforts to implement passenger rail service on the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line. So the agreement, as uh, discussed earlier this morning, the agreement between the Regional Transportation Commission and Progressive Rail reserves the right to the RTC to use the rail corridor as long as it does not materially interfere with the railway's operations. As clearly stated by Mr. Fellon this morning in his presentation, there is a commitment from Progressive Rail to cooperate and share the tracks. The next request from the commission was to provide a response from the Santa Cruz Metro on the Unified Corridor Study Preferred Scenario. So the RTC staff has been coordinating with Metro staff on the Unified Corridor Study. Staff from both agencies met a number of times to get input from Metro on the transit projects that were evaluated in the Unified Corridor Study. The RTC staff presented the draft results of the Unified Corridor Study to the Metro on October 26 to receive input on the study and the preferred scenario. The Metro staff recommendation was provided in your packet and the letter from Metro was provided as a handout to you today. Um, just in summary, some of the main points are that Metro supports a transit service on the rail right of way and Metro's would like to see an alternatives analysis that would iteratively assess the most appropriate mode of public transit on the corridor. An alternatives analysis used to be required as the first step in applying for Federal Transit Administration funds through the New Starts or Small Starts program. The current FTA or Federal Trans Transit Administration requirements for New Starts and Small Starts, which is a type of funding source that uh, would be uh, most reasonable for our community to um, 
apply towards transit on the rail right away. So the current requirements are to include the alternatives analysis as part of the environmental review in order to expedite the process. And the staff recommendation on the preferred scenario is to take the next step to perform an environmental review of passenger rail. So evaluating bus rapid transit in the alternatives analysis of the environmental review would allow for further analysis of transit in the corridor while making steps toward meeting funding requirements with the environmental review. Concern has been raised by Metro that funds to implement passenger rail service would take away funds for bus transit. The funding assessment in the Unified Corridor Study for Passenger Rail Service was consistent with the RTC rules and regulations and did not use funds typically available to Metro for bus transit. If passenger rail service was implemented along the rail right of way, an integrated rail and bus transit network would need to be developed to provide the Santa Cruz County community with the most efficient and effective transit system. Additional revenue from a new funding source would be needed to implement any of the Unified Carter Study scenarios, including additional funding to expand transit service and implement passenger rail service. Metro and RTC are partner agencies with many of the same board members. Collaborative decisions can be made in steps to take advantage of this incredible opportunity that we have for our community to have a dedicated transit facility that runs the length of the county. The next question was, what would happen to the continuity of the rail right-of-way if RTC did not implement passenger rail? How much of the right-of-way is easements across property not owned by the RTC? In the 2009 title report, there are approximately 120 parcels listed that are along the main tracks of the rail right-of-way, and approximately 10% of these are easements across other properties. There are also approximately 12 to 50 parcels with unknown title along the rail right-of-way. That number is much harder to define, and as projects are implemented, more and more of this information will become clearer. The last question was to ask the new executive director, Guy Preston, to provide his input on the draft preferred scenario. With that, I'd like to hand over the presentation to executive director Preston to provide his thoughts on the Unified Carter Study. Thank you, Ginger. I really appreciate the hard work that you've done on this, and your report today was wonderful. It, it really did answer a lot of questions. Um, I've, I've read the, the report, and, and it's really well prepared. Um, a lot of work went into it, a lot of time went into it, a lot of thought went into it. Um, I, I want to focus my report today on three opportunities. Um, the Uniform cor Corridor Study um, has the opportunity to provide me and, and my staff with initial direction as to what potential projects to move forward with. It also, number two, sends a message to our funding partners that are we, we are committed to improving congestion in a sustainable fashion. And thirdly, it'll help us to secure funding by sending, by, by serving as a multimodal corridor plan, which is a requirement for many of the funding programs, and that's for, for Highway 1. It's potentially for some bike projects, and it's also potentially for, for the rail corridor itself. So um, it's, a little premature for me to come in after um, staff and this community has spent a year working on the performance measures as well as the potential projects and scenarios to say that one thing should be done or another thing should be done differently. Um, I've only been on board for four days, but I think it was really smart to, to do the UCS we are in a situation right now in transportation funding where there's a lot out there and a lot of opportunities to move projects forward. And the UCS is a, a wonderful initial step, a, a necessary initial step for Santa Cruz County to use its Measure D funding to leverage additional funds so we can actually start delivering projects. Um, there's been a lot of concern that action on January 17th is going to be an end all and it's going to approve projects. And, and Ginger did a very good job today. And 
explaining that it does not do that. Um, um, we've had a lot of discussion today about next steps associated with just the environmental document for Highway 1. Um, I, am, I showed up today, I'm going to show up next month and the following month, and I'm going to continue to provide the Commission with guidance as to what the options are moving forward. But um, as of now, I think you've been provided with very good information from staff on on a direction, and um, I really ap appreciate how much has been done and the state that this agency is being handed over to me. Uh, thank you for those remarks. Uh, this is not an action item. This is just information. Are there questions that people have about the additional information? Mr. Bertrand. This is for, for Ginger. Uh, first off, um, my apologies to the Commission for jumping to this item too soon. I was focused on the Caltrans report and didn't notice that it's really your report. <laughs> I'm awfully sorry. Um, on page 23.3, uh, you mentioned in continuation of question four that there's 20 to 50 parcels. Um, we just don't have the information at this time. So you said as more uh, information becomes available, basically, you'll report. So where does that leave us right now? I mean, uh, we want to go ahead on, on various projects, and we're sort of not knowing if we can because of the title and our ability to use the right-of-way. Can you give me a sense of where you feel we stand right now? I hope that's not too general of a question. I'm going to pass that on to our uh, Deputy Director, Mendez. Yes, uh, Commissioner Bertrand, um, as, as I was reported to you, indeed, there are a lot of parcels for which there isn't sufficient or even any information, uh, and that is typical for, you know, very old and especially, and especially railroad rights of way. Right. And, and one of the one of the challenges in, when we were negotiating this with the with the Pacific, uh, that you know. In the time that this uh, rail line has been existen in existence, there was uh, an earthquake in 1906 in San Francisco, uh, with fires uh, there thereafter that, that destroyed a lot of us, a lot a lot, uh, and including offices of Southern Pacific who owned the the line at that time. So there were documents uh, that were destroyed, and uh, they did go through an effort of trying to uh, redo documents, but we were told they might not have redone everything, uh, so that's part of the reason. Uh, but there could be other reasons as well, that they, said they just didn't know why some of this information wasn't there. But as the attorneys that uh, the RTC hired to help us negotiate uh, this purchase, uh, communicated to the commission, um, you know, it's a, it's a rail line. It's been a rail line, and it can continue to be a rail line. So even with those, um, uh, with those parcels that for which we may not have information. Uh, as long as the commission wants to continue to use it as a rail line, that's not a problem. Um, uh, once the commission, if the commission decides to do something different, indeed, there'll be work necessary to, to figure out, okay, what does that mean for those, you know, a uh, few parcels that, uh, you know, we don't have the information for. So, and as Ginger said, as projects move forward on, on some uh, sections of the line, whether it be for trail or, or anything else, then we do delve more deeply into uh, the ownership issues and try to clear some of, the, some of those things to make sure that, that, that we know what the situation is so we can move forward with those projects. Okay. Um, hope we don't have problems in that regard. Uh, there was public testimony that uh, perhaps there could be an issue if we added a different use to the corridor. So if it's not rail, solely rail, but if we add a different use, whether it's a fiber optics line or a trail, which is part of our plan right now. Do you have any comments on that? I think, again, that, de that depends on the ownership situation in each particular section of the line. Uh, uh, so there could be some of those uh, potential uh, issues. And again, as we move forward with specific projects, then we do have to do, do the work to you know, figure out the, uh, those issues. And some of what we're finding out too is that uh, the RGC actually you know, owns more than, than we thought we acquired for Union Pacific or the Union Pacific thought that, that they owned. Uh, 
Right. Uh, so it's you know so it's 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 a variety of things. In some cases, we may actually have quite a bit more. In some cases, you know, we we'll just need to clear up and make sure that that indeed the documentation is there uh, for what the RTC acquired and the RTC needs. Okay, um, I understand that. Um, I guess the basis of my question is based on what the public input was. If we change the use, and my understanding of our right to use that corridor is because it's to move freight. And if we change the use something to other than moving freight, I is that a real issue? Is that something that you know we need to be thinking about? From our, uh, our uh, my understanding is that there can be issues potentially in some in some sections of the line. But again, we just we will need to delve into specific sections, you know, more deeply to uh, figure that out. And, and um, you know, a lot of sections of, of, of the line, the RTC owns the property outright in fee and can do different, uh, you know. Yeah, I see it's not a problem there. With it. but, but we want a continuous, but if you want a continuous continu route. A continuous, a continuous right of way, um, if you do take out the track, and that's something that, you know, uh, negotiators that the RTC used uh, um, uh, in uh, uh, law firms that, that um, uh, were hired by the RTC, um, they did say, as long as you continue to use this as a rail corridor, you, can, you will be able to keep it as a, you know, uh, uh, as a continuous corridor. If you do something different, there might be some additional work you need to do, you know, to, to make sure that that's the case. Do we know that this has come up in other situations where perhaps they did a rail and a uh, other means of transportation, let's say walk path or a bike path? I'm just wondering if there's some law on this particular issue. I don't know off the top of my head. So. Okay, so you can understand my concern. Thank you. Are there other questions um, uh, about this? Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Chair. So I'm going to go jump right to the metro question because I think it's an important uh, part of this whole discussion. Um, you know, Churchill talked about the gathering storm pre-World War II, and I think there's a storm gathering right here between the RTC in some respects and also metro. And they bring up some interesting points, and I'll uh, refer to 2314 at the very bottom. And forgive me for reading, but I think it's significant where they say, However, the scenario-based approach used in the UCIS did not analyze nor present specific data comparison between passenger rail and BRT in this corridor and would provide a clear choice between these two options. And then the mode selection in this corridor should not be based on a choice between steel and rubber wheels, but rather on the surface profile, alignment frequency, daily span of service that most effectively meets the travel patterns and mobility needs in this area. So um, I'm hearing that, uh, according to this, and uh, a well-respected entity, namely Metro, is saying, we need more study. We need more options in order to kind of, uh, before we kind of step out and make this, uh, you know, uh, to Guy's point, Mr. Pr uh, Executive Director Preston's point about this is not, what we decide is not the end all, but if we decide prematurely to go on in one direction before we have all the information, it does set us up for moving, spending money, and so forth be before we have all the data that is necessary to make an informed decision. So help me understand uh, this conflict a little bit more <coughs> and what we're prepared to do about it. Uh, namely, the conflict that uh, Metro is saying, we need more time, we have to study this corridor more effectively, and fully explore the options that are truly available for us to make the best decisions possible. The staff recommendation that was presented at the November 15th meeting was to um, pursue passenger rail service by initiating the environmental review. Within the environmental review, as required by the Federal Transit Administration, there's an alternatives analysis that is required in order to pursue funding through their agency. So the, um, the next step in uh, staff's mind is to initiate that step with the evaluation of bus rapid transit as part of the alternatives analysis within the environmental review. So would that be, a, would that just be a complimentary 
a choice uh, added on top of rail or would it be something that would be exclusively one or the other? When you said complementary choice on top of rail. Well, I mean, you have rail. Uh, conceivably, we, t we heard before about places where uh, there's bus rapid transit and rail and bike and everything else. So would, 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 would uh, bus rapid transit uh, be a, a true alternate choice or would it just be a complementary choice in okay. addition to rail? Okay. Um, the vision that I was, uh, what, the, what the staff recommendation would be, would be to evaluate bus rapid transit instead of passenger rail service. So it would be one service or the other. There is the potential if freight was to remain for the tracks still to remain in place, bus rapid transit to occur on top of that with a paved service. Uh -huh. um, but obviously it's up to the discretion of this commission. But we're, we're, we're on track to vote in early or middle January uh, to choose a preferred scenario, yet I'm hearing that we need more study, more information, particularly with respect to uh, bus rapid transit and all the benefits that rubber provides for uh, the most effective transportation modes available for the public. Is, so before we vote on something like that, do we need more study? Uh, is it premature for us to vote in January? Uh, the maybe, maybe, uh, maybe Mr. Preston has something he wants to add. Sure, that's yeah, I'll, 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 maybe it'll help if I talk about this um, a little bit. Um, so again, the decision in January is just on a preferred scenario um, on a planning document that only goes so far. And a lot of the additional information that people are asking for can take place in the next step. Um, it doesn't mean that we're approving any one form of transportation on the line. Um, CEQA requires a scoping period. It also requires an alternative analysis. So during the scoping period, anybody can bring up whatever modes of transportation they would like to see analyzed. And then that would be reviewed and decided as to what alternatives would move forward. So it's an iterative process and um, it allows a lot of flexibility moving forward. But it's, it's important to have this planning document done so we can start to take those tests and uh, steps and, and make that progress. Um, and with the way the funding works, I mean, there's a potential that we can get another agency to help fund these studies, especially if um, we've, cooperated with them and are looking at the performance measures that were important to them and um, you know, prepared the plans and the prerequisites necessary to acquire that funding. So it's really a, a, an opportunity and the initial additional analysis would take place no matter what. So are you saying that uh, once a choice is made on a scenario, that does not become the default direction of this, this agency? And absent any sort of compelling reason to go off that, that becomes that becomes the uh, direction that um, we follow. Well, it's initial direction, and over time, direction changes. I mean, there was a direction to pursue HOV lanes, you know, at one point as our number one priority. Now it's after 3035. It changes over time. I mean, this is. The, the issues associated with all of these different projects are it's dynamic, and we're looking at a snapshot in time based on performance measures that were provided in this, this scenario analysis. And um, over time, I, I intend to come back with strategies of moving projects forwards, and, that, and this commission will have the opportunity to weigh in on how best to do that, and you know, there's been a lot of questions already on how best to do that on other projects, and and we will come back with different ideas and strategies moving forward, and and project approval would be much further down the line. I think that's appropriate uh, as long as this commission and staff are open-minded, logical, and moving in the best uh, interests of the community and taxpayers. So, 
I guess I'm okay with that. Completely understood. Other questions? Uh, Mr. Mulhorn? Thank you very much. Um, uh, so this, the UCS is not a legally binding document, planning level, 50,000 feet look at uh, a snapshot of our community. Um, the, the document itself also acknowledges that um, <clears throat> a lot of the pro project level decisions that are gonna have to be made in order to implement a scenario are actually gonna be made by other agencies. Metro, for example, uh, local jurisdictions will have to also agree to implement uh, these projects or build the projects or do the projects. Um, so, but I also understand that we need a corridor study because we'll, it'll help us with the solutions for congested corridors under SB1, which is new money for us. But I, I don't understand why, why do we need to choose a scenario? If the scenarios are not legally binding and the information is useful to us in the decision-making process for future project level decisions, why do we need a scenario? My, my answer to that is because it, it sends a message and it helps us secure the funding moving forward that we're serious uh, about it. Um, and often when um, you submit your application and you submit all the attachments that they ask for and we submit a corridor plan, they're gonna wanna see a resolution from our board that we have your support moving forward to the next step. So, so that's why it's important to, to, to make a choice. But you know, I'm trying to provide you with the assurances that you know, based on the future studies, and, you know, we can change direction strategically based on, on the findings that we find moving forward. But this meets the requirements of that plan and they're gonna be looking to know that, that this commission actually supports that, that plan. At, at this time. A, speci a specific scenario will help us in our securing new funds for these projects. Absolutely. So okay, thank you. Mr. Schiffer. Um, I think it's fascinating to hear from commissioners uh, a desire for more studies. Um, I remember um, not so vaguely uh, criticisms of the commission of studying things to death, um, but somehow they keep coming. Um, I think also it's important to be real here about what this process is all about, the Unified Corridor Study. It's about whether there's gonna be a rail line or whether there's gonna be trail only. The commission made an agreement as a part of Measure D uh, that it would study the trail only option. The Unified Corridor Study studies trail only option. Scenario B, which tends to be the direction that staff is recommending, is rejecting that option and saying we're going to keep the corridor. We're going to keep the corridor for uh, transit, maybe rail, maybe bus rapid transit. But it's going to be uh, the tracks are not going to be removed. It's very important that the commission make that decision. That decision will also say we're going to have freight on the line if Progressive Rail can deliver. It's fascinating that half the people who hate Progressive Rail hate them because they're going to fail. Well, if they fail, they fail. I mean, that's, uh, they're, they're, they think they'll succeed. Maybe they m will, maybe they won't. But on January 17th, along with the reasons that the uh, executive director is giving for, ex uh, for approving a scenario, is that it's going to put to rest, at least in the short term, the issue of is, there, is the commission supporting ripping up the tracks and just having a trail only? That's, to my mind, that's the key decision that's gonna be made in January. Um, I actually don't agree with the staff recommendation at this point to initiate the CEQA process, uh, assuming that the commission does approve scenario B. I think if we're going to ultimately have uh, a, a, a rail, some kind of transit on the line, uh, it's gonna have to be integrated with the uh, transit district and it makes sense before we start a CEQA process that we'll have to identify a preferred alternative is if we, that we really look at the, all, the transit alternatives on the line, which is the way I read what the transit district is recommending, is that let's keep the option open of what kind of transit will be on the line. They don't want to rip, they're not recommending, uh, it seem they seem to be opposing the idea of ripping up the tracks, but they're saying we don't know 
what the best transit option is. Let's, let's look at that. And that's the study that I think needs to be done. But it's subsequent to the decision as to, are we going to keep the tracks or are we going to rip up the tracks? And that's got to be the first decision. Once that decision is made, then I think it makes sense to hopefully get a grant, if not use uh, funds that we have, to really look at what are the best options or what may be the best, most feasible option for using that rail line. Um, is it passenger rail with a train? Is it some kind of a bus-related kind of a vehicle? I don't know. I think it's worth looking at. And once we get through that, then it makes sense to do uh, a CEQA analysis with the preferred option at that time and uh, look for, you know, get, get that looked at and then try to find funding to, to, uh, to carry it out. But that's how I see wh where we're going here and wh one of the reasons why I think it's really critical that the commission make a decision on the Unified Corridor Study. As has been said, it's not legally binding, it's not set in stone, but it does provide an answer to the Measure D problem and it does uh, provide help, it appears, in terms of getting funding to go move forward with, al uh, with alternatives, whether highway alter alternatives or other alternatives. Sure. Thank you. Cheers. Yes. I just, oh, well, just want to make sure people who haven't got the chance to ask questions. Just checking here. Mr. Bertrand and then Mr. Johnson. I appreciate it. I think Andy did a good s summary there. And uh, um, so I'm learning about the process as we go forward. So I think part of the discussion has been this idea that we're making this definite decision. And our new executive director, uh, you know, portrays what we're trying to do. We're making a decision now so we can move forward and refine our decision, if, if that's a good way of looking at it. Because we're going to be studying options and we'll get a better idea what carrying out a, a decision or a scenario right now entails. And at that point, we'll have a better understanding of how to proceed. Th does that sound about right? I think you nailed it. Okay. So, um, again, I want to go back to my original question on page 23.7. And um, this refers to Proposition 16 funds. Um, there's been a mention of how much money we have to pay to get out of that obligation. And there's other funds mentioned here, um, Central Federal Lands, STP, and PTA. So I'm just trying to get a better understanding of how all these funds um, interact in terms of uh, how we use the line for moving people if we were going to back out. So what kind of obligations are we on? I mean, I, I know the 10.5, but I mean, are there other funds and these are just listing some of them, so I'm just trying to get an understanding of that. So in the Unified Corridor Study, we took a look at if the, um, if the trail only option was chosen or if bus on the um, rail right of way was chosen, what, potential, what would the, be the potential cost associated with that? And so the Proposition 116 funds, um, would potentially need to be paid back, um, as well as an increase in the um, cost based on current real estate estimates. Um, uh, a uh, approximate number there is about 29 million when you include both the um, payment for to the uh, California Transportation Commission, as well as funds that were utilized to um, repair La Selva Bridge and other bridges. Um, Beyond that, there was there's uh, about ten and a half million dollars that we received or that are um, from Central Federal Lands for the Segment Five Trail on the North Coast. Currently, the um, requirement is to meet the deadline of construction start by 2020. Um, we would not be able if there was a trail only or a, a bus rapid transit. Um, we would not necessarily be able to start that trail by 2020 because it's currently designed for the trail next to rail. Um, and there was also a cost for staff time in order to evaluate how we would move forward with not having tracks and moving towards a trail only or um, a bus on the rail right of the way. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Chair. I just uh, very quickly just wanted to take issue with uh, Commissioner Schifrin's, um, I guess, comments. You know, I think embedded in his um, are the subtexts that anybody who wants more information is somehow, uh, you know, off track and 
uh, is just a, a, a secondary way of, of uh, stalling and delaying and uh, just wanting a, tra a trail only. That's not my intention at all. Um, we, you know, if anything, you know, we have in front of us, uh, as far as the train is concerned, anemic ridership numbers. We have, uh, nobody has pointed out a clear way how we're gonna fund something like a train. And the first and last, last mile uh, associated with uh, train travel and, and passenger rail service has not been decided and it's very, very unclear. We know that every time somebody shifts from, from one seat to another in transportation, whether it's from a car to a bus or from a, from a train to a bus, uh, you lose ridership because of delays and so forth. So the, the question that we really should be asking is, how are we gonna pay for it? How, is it gonna be successful? And you know, before we just kind of embark on uh, you know, a, a train as a, as a solution to all of our transportation problems, we have to ask hard questions. And the only way to ask hard questions is to get more, more information. So I'm not uh, a trail only person. I'm, you know, at some point somebody has to defend the taxpayers of this county. And the only way that this, any sort of you know, uh, additional transportation solutions are gonna happen is another big hefty tax increase. So if you're gonna do that, uh, let's spell it out how we're gonna uh, best serve the taxpayers and make this feasible instead of just kind of pie in the sky. Well, thank you for your comments. Uh, I, uh, um, I appreciate uh, that you were able to answer these questions uh, directly. And I agree that this is a planning document uh, for us and it, it it, it, it doesn't cast in stone the direction, but it provides the guidepost that we are gonna be asking you as staff to, to complete. And we may disagree on uh, uh, at the moment about how that should be done, but uh, providing those guideposts through the scenario is the best way to, to give direction to you as the staff in order to accomplish that goal. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate the clarity and I look forward to what I'm sure will be a robust discussion uh, at the January 17th meeting. Thank you for all the work that you've put into this uh, so far. I do wanna give a chance for people in the public uh, to make comments um, uh, about this. I guess I'm up. Stanley Sokolow again. Yeah. Uh, so I just wanna emphasize what I wrote in a letter to you, which disturbs me a lot, that you're considering what to do with the rail corridor where you don't know that you own the corridor, the, these parcels that are still clouded, why hasn't effort been made to clear that up in court before deciding do we wanna put a bus instead of the train? You, you don't know you can even do that. But let's say you do decide to do the bus instead of the train and you go through the process of all the detailed planning and then there are objections from the parcel owners you're gonna to have to spend more money to do eminent domain if they don't agree to a price for buying what you thought you owned. So where's the price figured in these financial estimates for doing the legal process and paying for the, the right or the parcel, either the easement or the parcel, that you don't actually own for anything other than a train right now? I, I see that as a glaring error and, and you're proceeding to spend money and time on setting the alternatives that you may not have. So uh, I, I think you should stop and deal with the legal issue. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, can I just, before you start, uh, Mr. Nelson, get a, a sense of how many people wanna speak to this item? I'm trying to get a sense, if all those people speak for three minutes a piece, uh, we will be here uh, way past one o'clock and I'm concerned about keeping my quorum together, uh, so I wanna, I'm gonna ask that you only speak for two minutes in the hopes that we can get through as many people as possible before I, that happens. Thank you, I'm Jack Nelson. Um, uh, bottom line up front is I encourage your commission to support a kind of scenario B, perhaps uh, making a clarification that you in the future do intend to further evaluate uh, train versus bus on the rail corridor. Um, but let me back up from that a bit and suggest that you have invisible forces at work 
that we all need to be considering, and they're some of the most important ones. Uh, you know, just give you an example of an invisible force. Right now, and I know you commissioners are all busy people who like to get things done, so just consider what you're getting done. We together are all traveling right now at 66,000 miles an hour on this planet in our orbit, or annual orbit around the sun. That's 100 times the speed of a speeding bullet. So I can snap my fingers twice and you're in Watsonville at that speed. That's how fast we're getting things done here, folks. Um, another invisible force is uh, what's in this room, uh, over 400 parts per million carbon dioxide. The scientists know from studying ancient ice cores that go back 800,000 years, it hasn't been that high in all that time and they believe not in several million years. So that's a force that's going to show up in the future that could, as people have already suggested in your room here today, uh, change, if not crash, our civilization. So that's a pretty big force to be working to resolve, as we all have an obligation to do. I would like to suggest that individual travel units with a tailpipe are what we need to be think of, thinking of as the past. Uh, community travel units in a place like the rail corridor is part of our future. So that's why I'm here to encourage you to support something like a scenario B, and I hope you do that soon. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Bud Colligan, Live Oak resident. Um, I wanted to say that uh, not much has really changed in this rail trail debate over the past four years. The presentation I gave to many of you in July of 2015 outlined the issues and why the plan of record did not work for ridership, cost, health, safety, and environmental reasons. And those reasons today are still the same. The only thing that has changed is the price tag has doubled. The price tag for the train over 30 years was 660 million in the rail transit feasibility study. Now, it's $1.3 billion over 30 years. The cost of the trail next to the rail was 127 million, touted by many of you for the last four years, and it's now 283 million, according to the UCS, more than double. We know we don't have this money, and the likelihood of getting it is extremely small. This process is really broken. It's broken because the commission has so far refused to step back and recognize that at least half the community does not agree with the plan of record. The process is broken because the commission doesn't seem to fully grasp the implications of the ACL they signed, including locking in progressive rail for 10 years for freight, rail, and excursion services. That's the meaning of the vote on January 17th. There is a possible consensus solution. Five different communi community groups, many who usually don't agree, support Metro's proposal for an alternatives analysis on the corridor. Greenway has embraced public transit on the corridor to show its flexibility in trying to reach a win-win solution. We have proposed scenario R for realistic that not only supports a public transit option in each of the three corridors, but also spends taxpayer money wisely saving 423 million. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, I'm still Jack Carroll from Soquel. Um, any train past Watsonville is gonna require a new tax. Uh, that tax is gonna be the size of the uh, previous uh, Measure D. Uh, Measure D had a prohibition of using money for a new train. That's how much the voters hated a train. Now, can you imagine a new Measure D of the same size that's going to be used exclusively for a train? Nobody thinks that that's going to pass. Sales tax in Watsonville and Santa Cruz is already nine and a quarter percent. There is no money with the California rail plan. It doesn't come funded. As a matter of fact, they don't even plan on asking for anything for our corridor for a generation. 
There's just no money to be had. The uh, actual Santa Cruz uh, SB1 is called the Highway, uh, called the Road Repair and Accountability Act of 2017. The name should tell you how much Santa Cruz Watsonville rail money is in there. Um, I asked the staff on uh, November 8th as to where the um, available potential government funding would be, uh, would come from, and I haven't heard yet uh, from them, and I have checked my spam filter. And uh, finally, um, the Cal Ramp Rail Plan acknowledges that uh, there's going to be uh, abandoned rail, rail lines as a fact of life and uh, uh, that they can be rail banked for future use. And uh, I suggest that we do that as soon as possible. Please don't underestimate the consequences of keeping the tracks in place. Every decision you make that assumes the possibility of a train is more expensive than necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi, Gary Pico again, and I still want to have this love affair with uh, Andy. We would be married, except that we'd always disagree on one final thing. And Try so, to keep what? Marks to the entire. Okay, what I do want to say is, Andy's completely right. Probably the dis the major decision is rip out the tracks or not. Okay, the disagreement with with what's going on is we are going to rip out the tracks no matter what if you're going to have a passenger rail besides a tourist train that runs a little bit. You're going to rip it out. Everybody knows that. That's in the, in the study. The question really is, can we use the corridor until transit on the corridor is figured out? That's really the question that Greenway and everybody else in me is, is actually asking is, don't commit to a fi fiscal disaster until you really have the money to pay for the end, which is also what somebody said. So the question is, what do you do in the meantime? And that's why I always bring up rail banking. I'm not a true trail proponent, by the way, but rail banking will protect the county and the city or whatever against losing money, okay? Because the federal government takes stewardship of it. Lastly, uh, secondly, where's the rail trail cost that was requested at the last meeting that was a, a, a staff item that was supposed to be done. They were supposed to review the cost of the, the rail, because I, I came up saying it would be about 400 to 500 million dollars, if you recall. And you guys voted on, on that request. And lastly, the UCIS does actually take action. It, uh, it nails in the progressive contract, it kicks in. So uh, there is, a, there is a, a, a result that happens with that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, commissioners. Manu Koenig, Executive Director of Santa Cruz County Greenway. I sent you two documents ahead of the meeting and they're being passed around now, I hope. Uh, the first is a statement of principles for the coastal corridor. We drafted these at the suggestion of Kurt Triplett, city manager from Kirkland, Washington, whose presentation on his city's own rail to trail conversion, many of you will remember. We hope more groups and ultimately this commission will join us in improving and endorsing these principles so our community can move forward together. Also in the spirit of collaboration today, we are introducing scenario R, a realistic and doable transportation scenario for our community. Scenario R embraces trail and transit on the rail right of way. It makes significant investments in bus rapid transit on the corridor, which can be implemented faster and more flexibly than passenger rail. By building a multi-purpose roadway that bikes and electric bus can share, we can build the trail at a much lower cost than RTC staff's current preferred scenario. But scenario R does not stop there. It makes significant investments in bus rapid transit light on SoCal Freedom, in addition to the intersection improvements recommended by staff. It also invests in bus on shoulder on Highway 1 and fully funds the auxiliary lanes project to San Andreas Road. Note that because of profligate spending allocations for a train, RTC staff's current prefer preferred scenario does not have enough money to complete auxiliary lanes, which means its bus on shoulder program would be stuck in the worst AM traffic, making it, effectively, making it ineffective. Scenario R also has enough funds left over to fix the critical Highway 1 and Highway 9 intersection with additional lanes on San Lorenzo River Bridge. In conclusion, Scenario R is realistic, effective, and affordable set of projects. It provides congestion relief and public transit options on all three corridors for $423 million less 
then RTC staff's current preferred scenario, and it costs about half the annual, uh, annual operating expenses. It can be implemented sooner, more flexibly, and realistically, and we hope you'll join us in making it our scenario for the community. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Good, afternoon. Good morning, uh, afternoon, commissioners. My name is Rick Longinati. I'm co-chair of the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Our group has supported transit on the rail corridor for many years. Uh, we just don't know what kind of transit. We don't have that information, and the U UCIS doesn't really give us that information, so we support the Metro's request to do more study about determining that. Uh, I do have some slides that want to suggest an idea to add to that study, because that study needs to consider the whole transit network. Um, so we know from uh, the draft EIR on Highway 1 that um, uh, building auxiliary lanes will have a negligible effect on traffic congestion. Let's see what we do here. So this the, was under consideration by the draft EIR, something called the TSM alternative, of which the auxiliary lanes in Measure D made up less than 25% of the spending. Um, the draft EIR, whoa, whoa, it's moving faster than I want. Can, can I back this up here? I'm not having much. I think you're on auto. <laughs> well, okay. Um, can you operate this for me? Yeah. Thank you. You're still gonna have the two minutes, Rick. Yeah, I'm thank you. Done. Next slide, please. Okay, so the, we know from the draft EIR that this TSM alternative would have, quote, a very slight uh, improvement in traffic congestion, and even that is overstated according to Susan Handy. Next slide. Um, so if we only spending a quarter of the TSM alternative, how much can we expect in terms of congestion relief? That's where I get the word negligible. Next slide. So why would we spend the money? Uh, staff is recommending auxiliary lanes as a stepping stone to the HOV project. So making this the goal of the commission, the HOV project sometime after 2035 has an impact today because we're spending money on something that's a goal in the future, a goal that is unrealistic. So the idea that, uh, that I want to leave you with is instead of spending that money on the auxiliary lanes, 105 million for Measure D money, you put it into the bus on shoulder and make a real bus on shoulder system that works. Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon. Hi, uh, my name is Will Mayo. I'm a board member of Greenway, but I'm representing myself. I've lived in Santa Cruz County with my wife for over 50, 40 years. I was an early employee at Apple and have a deep background in technology. I love to surf, bike, hike, and ride trains. The UCS has many issues, and Scenario B is an especially poor choice. One particularly disturbing aspect of Scenario B is an excursion train. Scenario B requires $15 million for an excursion train. An excursion train does nothing to address transportation issues in the county. The new train was clearly included to or in order to satisfy the passenger train requirement that handcuffs the RTC as a result of the $11 million grant from the CTC. But the excursion train will cost 15 million. That's 15 million to save 11 million. And where will the 15 million come from? Measure D's ex expenditure plan does not allow funding for any new train or rail service. Also in Measure D, if the RTC determines that the best use of the corridor is an option other than rail transit, funds may be utilized for other transportation improvements. Instead of spending 15 million on an excursion train, perhaps it makes more sense to use the Measure D funds to pay back the 11 million and save 4 million. An excursion train from Santa Cruz to Davenport for $15 million is not what this county needs from the RTC. It would be effectively a subsidy to the rail operator. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you. Hi, Brian Peoples, Trail Now. Um, you received my notice on our support of um, the Metro's plan. Our tweak was that it's not necessarily public transit. Uh, we would call it mass transit. Um, I do want to say that a decision on scenario B actually will 
um, make a difference. It's already making difference in property values. In Aptos Village, actually, the, the, the rental rate was lowered for some commercial property there because of the current rail plan. So if you come out and they decide that you're gonna have a train, all of the properties on those sales will have to disclose that that's going to be a, a, a railroad, 60 trains a day. So, so there is a significant issue there in that. I won't go on to the other items uh, that Greenway and everybody's called out on, but we need to use the corridor today. We need to use it now. Um, I do want to reiterate the, the importance, value that actually George on his retirement, I wanna give him some credit here. I want to give him some credit on successfully getting the Highway 1 plan done and get, helping get Measure D through. So those two achievements we need to leverage. Let's focus on that today. When you go to the California Transportation Commission and you're going out and you're saying, we have a plan, Highway 1, we are very far along on that, okay? But if you go and tie our hands today on the coastal corridor with a rail plan, that's not the right path. Follow our, the community's request, but don't just limit to public transit. Call it mass transit. Look at alternatives. Look at how technology is changing the way individuals can get around. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Brett Garrett. Um, one, uh, easements. I think we need a lot more information about easements. I'm, I'm hearing so many different interpretations of what the easements say. I've, I've never seen the wording of one of these easements. I have no idea what they actually say. Um, we're kind of missing the scope. We have a number of parcels. We don't know if they're big parcels or small parcels. Um, I would just urge whatever steps to pursue quit, quit claim deeds or you know whatever whatever the commission can do to pursue full ownership of the rail corridor. Um, I think needs to be done or full you know just affidavits from owners saying that they're willing to allow this to happen or that to happen. I've, I've heard people even allege, even if we have rail plus trail, that the easements might not allow bicycles to be on that trail and um, somebody might raise a fuss. Um, scenario choice, I'm, I'm still trying, I still don't know why people are talking about scenario B as the preferred scenario when it really looks a lot like scenario E to me. Um, but whatever is decided on that, I think the, maybe it should be clear that it's an agnostic, that it's, that the scenario includes transit on the corridor without specifying what the transit is. Um, because I think the preferred scenario is very clear that it's rail and if, if you don't want that clarity yet, don't, don't approve it that, that with that clarity. Um, I strongly agree with the Metro that we need a comprehensive alternatives analysis, and they were very clear in the last Metro meeting, they're not talking about the alternatives analysis in the CEQA, they're talking about a separate alternatives analysis process to determine the best mode, um, and I'm, I just wanna advocate that one of the modes to be studied should be personal rapid transit. Um, and I'm out of time, so I guess that's all I'll say there. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair. Uh, Michael Sink, Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Quickly, uh, I wanna talk about Caltrans comments on the UCIS agenda item 23-6, uh, page 176, if you're on a computer. Uh, reliability and efficiencies number one, uh, Caltrans, uh, believes there's not enough detail on the study to depict true value of Highway 1 or benefits of HOV, and maybe because there are no benefits is, would be my understanding. Uh, number uh, B is forecast a decrease in carpooling for HOV lanes, which uh, Ginger talked about, um, and they thought these are unexpected uh, results. Uh, let me give you some ideas why that may happen. People want to drive alone, 76%. Uh, they do not want to wait for a ride and share it with other people. They do not want to be inconvenienced. And here's an interesting one that I'll give you to think about. Once HOV lane becomes successful, it becomes unsuccessful. So, and that's basically saying people will start out using the HOV lane. It may become popular. That lane fills up and it's actually going slower than the ones that are 
single occupancy. My wife can answer that one. She goes to Stanford every day. She says, my sticker does no good. She sits in lane, HOV lanes stopped. The only way the HOV lanes are successful, according to the study I read, priority for high occupancy vehicles is most beneficial when there are large numbers of people in buses, period. C, HOV lanes are sustainable according to Caltrans. Uh, not, um, it just doesn't happen, and that's, we can reference the previous uh, answer on that one. Basically, do not like scenario E, scenario B original, without any more development for car usage, and we need to do put the freight in Watsonville. Thank you, you do not need ox lanes to have bus on shoulder. Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <coughs> My name is Johanna Leiko. Nervous, so bear with me. Um, I wanted to reiterate what Mr. Garrett said, that I think the preferred scenario is not really B, it's a, they call it B plus or B modified or whatever. It is closer to E. B was changed with four modifications to create this preferred. They added auxiliary lanes, uh, omitted the BRT light and express, and they added freight. But the changes to E are only two and it would be adding the bus on the shoulder and removing the HOV lane. So, um, and beyond the 2035 scenario is exactly like E. It, it goes right down the list. So um, I encourage you to go back to study the study and reread the performance measures of E. Um, I hope you'll invite stakeholders and local agencies to do the same because their uh, recommendations may change. On the table of the preferred scenario, table three, if you go down the listing, the beyond 2035, all those numbers are the exact same under E. Um, the preferred, if you compare it to B, the safety number is the same, but B, at this preferred scenario has auxiliary lanes, so I would think the safety or collision rate would change. Um, one information, what important thing is that uh, buses on shoulders are faster than the rail transit under this. And under equitable access, the vehicle mile, uh, transit vehicle miles traveled is listed at 5.3, B was 6.65, which is one and a half million miles less per year for transit. So I think that, that makes a difference. I hope that as you move forward, um, you will know that transit doesn't mean train. Uh, remember communities as well as commu commuters and choose function over potential funding. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi, Sally Arnold, uh, Santa Cruz resident. So this bus versus train discussion, um, I think, you know, we've heard some people talk about it. I think it can continue after you approve um, scenario B, preferably not E, which is, I agree, kind of what they've presented to you in January. The, um, I don't think you should delay your decision about the tracks until after all the legal questions are an about the easements are answered. It'll take way too long. Whatever the future investigation does reveal, our best bet to keep the easements is to save the tracks. As um, was mentioned in the uh, report that came with the packet today, it's not possible to determine the extent to which the rights to the easements may occur as the courts would evaluate the records for each property individually. So that means we're going to court and that's gonna take a long time and it's gonna be super expensive. And so let's keep the tracks so we have our best shot there. Um, I think that this one piece of information clearly guides your choice unless you wanna spend lots of time and lots of money in litigation, you must vote to preserve the tracks. The, um, there's, there are buses and trains that can both run on tracks. You can investigate those options after you approve the keeping of the tracks, but you have to keep them or at best our public transportation options are gonna be seriously delayed and at worst they are killed and the climate can't wait. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Good, uh, my good note says good morning commissioners, but it's a uh, good afternoon commissioners. I'm David Van Brink from uh, Santa Cruz. Uh, and uh, George isn't here, so I'll change this to the third person. I wanted to thank George uh, um, for everything he's done for our community and congratulations and wish him uh, best wishes on whatever is uh, next on his schedule. And also welcome to Guy Preston. I'm sure we'll have lots of interesting times ahead. 
I wanted to offer a very quick thought. Please be skeptical of citizen advocacy for alternative transportation on the corridor or interim usages. We've seen this strategy played out in other communities where uh, they advocate for essentially anything but rail. Uh, then as soon as the rails are deleted, that old advocacy disappears and they come back wearing their, you know, mirror universe goatees saying, you know, save our trail, no transit on the trail. Uh, so be skeptical. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon. Barry Scott, Aptos. Um, I have a, a lot of favorite co quotes, but one of them around transportation is by Enrique Peñalosa. He says, an advanced city isn't one where everyone drives a car, but one where uh, the rich and the poor all use transit. And I, I think as you make decisions and you look at, at that kind of guiding principle, uh, it won't be that hard to reach uh, some good conclusions. Um, there's an interesting discussion. I know a lot of people are saying, rail doesn't go where we need to go. A lot of transportation infrastructure and other infrastructure needs to be built for where things might be. There's a, a discussion between, uh, the, the, the kind of an argument between Jarrett Walker and Chuck Marone, both of them are trans transportation and planner, uh, planning experts. And uh, there's transportation-oriented development, which is to create uh, uh, transportation uh, and then build to it. And the other is development-oriented transportation, which would be to pull transportation projects into where, they're, where they're, the existing uses are. And I'd argue that if we develop our rail plan the way we, we would, it goes through a lot of areas that are ripe for new development. And that if we build it, and it's kind of a, if we build it, they will come kind of an argu uh, argument, but I think it's been shown to be true often that you build your infrastructure and then working with a, a general and regional plan, you see that infill starts occurring and that you're, you're, actually, have, you're actually providing for the future a very effective uh, system. And of course, it's not, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be seen as a bus versus train thing either because the best systems uh, are integrated. BRT doesn't have uh, a, a, an advantage over rail transit if it's express buses because you'll, you'll still have to transfer in a lot of cases to get to your ultimate destination. So I think we can have both. Uh, finally, I'd just like to say, I hope we get back to a point where trail only is off the table because it's been such a divisive thing. And Thank I hope you. we make a decision in January. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Chair and Commissioners. Welcome, Mr. Preston. My name is Yannicka Strauss. I'm the Director of Bike Santa Cruz County. And Bike Santa Cruz County has been consistent for the last 15 years on our position of the rail corridor, and that is to build the trail now and continue to study passenger rail. We appreciate staff making it clear today that the January 17th decision is to continue that study and perform an alternatives analysis for transit in the corridor, the next step for any type of transit in that corridor. We ask the commission to please make the commitment on January 7th, 17th to continue building the trail as planned, which is the fastest way to implement the trail and will drastically improve safety for current cyclists and will encourage new cyclists to bike for daily trips. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Ashley Wynn from La Salva Beach. I'd like to address the preferred scenario and ask that the small electric buses be the preferred option on the rail corridor. The cost is better, the flexibility is greater, the environmental consequences are better. Second, I would ask that the Hove lanes be prioritized sooner than 2035. They provide the most effective relief. They could be limited to electric vehicles, electric buses, and um, uh, carpools. It creates more passenger mile results than any other option, as indicated in the uh, last uh, board meeting. Third, um, why invest in infrastructure uh, of a rail when 1.25 uh, miles of the rail corridor will be gone by the end of this century? That makes no sense based on the climate issues. Fourth, um, the fact that the, uh, the staff has not been able to provide a more meaningful discussion of the rail banking idea and the concern over easements 
indicates that this problem may only be a, fictum, um, a fantasy. What attorney, what property owner wants to challenge the corridor's ownership issues when there are no records, according to Mr. Uh, Luis Mendez. Uh, so the, the, the likelihood of a lawsuit, I think, is questionable. Not saying it can't happen, but I am a lawyer, and I would look very carefully before I chose that lawsuit. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Commission, and welcome, Mr. Preston. Um, I'm from Watsonville, um, and I just just want you to make sure that when you make your decisions that you consider the needs of Watsonville residents um, and also greenhouse gas reduction. It's very important to us. Um, um, I also hope that all the possible um, outside funding sources are pursued for the studies that are needed to determine the best use of the corridor and to move forward so that we don't use our local money for that. Um, from my point of view, you already have a rail line, and it seems to me that a rail line that you already have that's in existence can be brought online much more quickly than, um, than the massive construction and environmental impact that would be needed for highway widening or, or other highway projects. Um, and, and as we know from the um, UCS study, all of our options are gonna be really expensive. And the longer we wait, the more they're gonna cost. So thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, commissioners. Keith Otto. Um, our Thanksgiving dinner table conversation included discussion about things we think we know, but we really don't, or we don't fully understand. Um, that included discussion about expressions or sayings that are often misused. Um, and uh, or they've deviated so far from their original usage. And one of these was, you've got another thing coming. Um, the, original ex the original expression was, you've got another think, think with a K, coming. And that would be my ask of the commission here. Think carefully about the decisions that are being uh, considered. Um, I try to do my part to have my other think, uh, to get involved, to stay informed, to get updated. Uh, my view is that uh, other than freight in Watsonville, it makes no sense to pursue passenger or freight rail services in the corridor. Simply put, uh, it's too costly to implement, too costly to maintain, maintenance being a forever liability, and there's too little benefit. Rather, um, pursue maximum investments in Highway 1, including HOV lanes, um, as well as further investment in SC Metro. Look, I'm not a transportation planner. Many that I talk to in my community share this view. Um, but I would ask that any decision go to the voters for validation or for correction. So um, let's all get on board with have another think uh, coming and thank you for your service. Thank you. And happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> Hi again. Climate change activist Naomi Klein asks, what if global warming isn't only a crisis? What if it's the best chance we're ever going to get to build a better world? Our little county has tremendous potential. We are full of people who are passionate and care and want to do the right thing. Measure D can allow us to build on our history of environmental activism to show mid-sized communities around the world how to evolve their transportation systems in time to help the future of mankind. Impactful climate change planning must be affordable, adaptable, and easy to implement, like a better bus system and a protected bike network. However, since most voters drive cars, letting go of parking in lanes to prioritize buses and install protected bike lanes will require tremendous political will equal or greater to the tireless efforts that Save Our Shores founders put forth to protect our marine sanctuaries 40 years ago. Losing Earth, the decade we almost stopped climate change, in the August 2018 New York Times Magazine, talked about the decade from 1979 to 1989, and explained how our future is always in jeopardy because public officials rarely possess the courage 
and compassion to think beyond low-risk policies during their elected terms. As a member of the public, I always feel disheartened when after a, heartfelt, a series of heartfelt testimony from the public, this commission ties things up with a bit of comic relief, as happened earlier today. It feels as if the public process is little more than political theater. The fact that the UCIS decision has been tied to the progressive rail contract greatly raises our stakes. The failure to understand the potential risks connected to that contract is putting our community at risk. Our children need us to recognize the severity of the climate change crisis and Thank take you. bold action and Thank take you. the time to do the right thing and figure out what that right thing is. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, seeing no one else, and uh, as this item does not require uh, any action, we're gonna move on to item number 24, which is the County Bicycle Wayfinding Signage Project. Uh, Ms. Schenk, thank you for waiting. I will try to keep this brief. Good afternoon. Um, seems I'm often here in the afternoons. So in 2015, we adopted a um, implementation plan for this project, and since then that has been our guiding document. Um, so I'll just give you a brief overview of the timeline. I have already talked previously about that guidance. In um, 2015, we also received an active transportation program grant to fund the implementation of this project and then completed environmental review in 2017. In March 2018, we completed the plan specifications and engineering phase. And, uh, and then in June of 2018, we went to the California Transportation Commission to ask for construction funding to be allocated to this project. They have allocated that funding and that funding um, in order to receive that funding, we have to be under contract or award the contract by December 28th of this year. So we released a bid for uh, construction for this project on October 31st, with bids due on November 21st. Um, after the, the package had been out for a while, um, we started to feel that there was not enough interest being garnered in the project. This was despite efforts of staff to contact over 40 different contractors. We advertised it um, publicly in newspapers as well as online and through the Central Coast Builders Exchange as well as on Bid Express. So in order to attract more interest, we um, extended the bid deadline, which is why in your packet there was a um, placeholder for the resolution. Uh, we did receive one bid. Uh, Linear Tech Striping is the name of the contractor. And so today we are asking for your approval to uh, award the contract to Linear Tech Striping with some contingencies. Their bid was below the engineer's estimate. They bid 205,000 and the engineer's estimate is 208,000. I'm happy to answer any questions before you take action. Hopefully this contractor will be able to uh, perform as uh, specified in the bid. And in fact, we'll be able to get this program implemented for less than uh, the contract, uh, the grant amount. So again, I move the staff recommendation and we should be best in negotiating the final the contract. So There's a motion by uh, Schiffer and seconded by Bottorf. Uh, I'll just say I'm very happy to, what, oh, McPherson? So it was seconded by McPherson. Um, I'm very happy to see this moving forward. Uh, we actually first approved uh, funding for this bike signage project way before 2015. I think it was 2010. So I'm glad to see we're finally gonna be able to do this. Uh, my question is, uh, where's the vendor coming from? Is it a local vendor or? They're from San Jose. We do have in the bid documents um, the Santa Cruz County Ordinance, which asks for 50% local labor. So they're in the process of providing that documentation, which is one of the contingencies that we have on the award. And, and this is countywide? Uh, the ordinance is for Monterey Bay Area, so the um, contractor could have employees from 
anywhere in the Monterey Bay area, it appears that they will have employees working on this project who are in Watsonville. Um, I, I was just asking, in terms of the signage, is that countywide signage? Oh, yes. Yes, it's it's through all five jurisdictions and Caltrans as well. Okay, right and um, the turn time of start to finish? Uh, we plan to finish it in 2019. We do not have a construction schedule yet. That's one of the early submittals. Okay, thank you. Uh, now I'll see if there's anybody in the public who has any testimony about this. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to our Commission for Action. All in favor of the recommended actions? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. That takes us to closed session. There are two items on our closed session agenda. Uh, would anybody like to comment about those before we go into closed session? Uh, Mr. Chair, actually, we will not need those items. Uh, after all, they were listed on the agenda in case they were needed, but they're not. Neither one. Whoa. All right. Uh, hey. Consider that your holiday gift. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And with that, we will adjourn uh, this meeting of the Regional Transportation Commission, and we'll return to these very chambers on Thursday, January 17th at 9 o'clock. Look forward to seeing you. Well, oh, we're, we are not having a TPW no, no. meeting. No. I think it's already been canceled. Yeah, yeah, yeah December 20th. We're not meeting before January 17th.